When Christ was born of Mary in Bethlehem at night, the star that shone made stable dark appear as noontime bright. Brightly it shone upon the manger, guiding the wise men with its light. Quasi ventus 
sabes tu leer und los, aber es kommt dies die Fahrt in Tuan ein Obis. Petalis ist die Nos in Manu in Iquitatis Nosre. Never over us 
I'm keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you on this December the 19th, 2022, just days before Christmas. I know, it's crazy. You're thinking, but Joe, it's been Christmas since October. Just go into a Walmart near you. Yeah, yeah, it's not started yet, okay? So you can finally get ready, prepare to decorate your Christmas tree. You can finally start putting out Christmas lights around your house. Put out that uh, nativity scene in front of your house. Ignore the fact that your neighbor's been doing this for three months now. You can start. (laughs) Praise be to God. Hey, big breaking news over the weekend. Huge, massive. Argentina won the uh, the football, the the foosball, the football, the the uh, soccer match. What they call that World Cup. The Uh, footy. The footy. Uh, so Argentina, a one, a Messi, of course, has the huge Jesus tattoo. So that means I guess we can all go get one now. And uh, congratulations to Ar- Argentina. Who's Messi? Uh, he's the, like the star. He should clean up a little bit. Footballer. Uh, the question is, will this mean Pope Francis will finally return to Argentina for a visit to the home country since he's been... What do you mean, dude? He's been uh, there... Um, elevated to the well, he chair. He went... Um, mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah, he's not... I wonder. I mean, it's time for a home tour. Time to go home. Argentina is the winner of the World Cup. Praise be to God. Congratulations. Uh, oh, also, I think another big news over the weekend was uh, the Pillar is being sued uh, by Archbishop Paglia. Uh, That's wild. Yeah. Uh, so apparently he didn't like their reporting on his using Vatican funds, allegedly using Vatican funds to renovate his apartment, so they're suing him. We did invite them on, but uh, they declined to come on, so we don't know what the status of that is. We'll keep you updated anyway. Oh, big news, huge news over the weekend. Massive, massive news. Uh, Elon Musk has put out a poll saying, hey, do you guys want me to step down or not? Yes or no? Who You want me to run Twitter? I will do whatever you tell me to. As of right now, 58% of people said, yes, we want you to step down. So he may quit soon, which means all of my Twitter blue checkmark dreams are over. It's time to pack it in. <laughs> uh, so, not sure about that. Uh, big news, huge news. I mean, massive breaking news over the weekend. I don't know if you caught this or not, but uh, Pope Francis has pre signed his resignation letter. Are we instead of a Conte territory here? I mean, he's already signed the letter that he's resigning. Now, of course, yes, it's in case he ever is incapacitated or, you know, so he's still Pope, but. That's kind of huge news. Like, it's weird, crazy news. What else? Anything Anything else over the weekend um, of note at all? Hmm. Oh, anything? Uh, Can you think of anything? Yeah, you know, there was, was that there one story. I can't what, remember if it something. was. Something. There was something, right? It was like on it was, Saturday it was sometime. Something about a mm-hmm. priest or. Yeah. No, I don't think anything happened. The Jesuit guy who had molested like nine nuns? Uh, no, 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 we, no, we've, no. We've ignored that already. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, I see. yeah. So I, oh, I, are you talking about the news about mm-hmm. uh, the fact that I made a gingerbread mm-hmm. house yesterday? Did you? Uh huh. Oh, that, really? that was the big news, right? Have you already eaten it? Uh, no. 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 Okay. No. You guys eat your uh, gingerbread houses? No. What? I take a picture of it it's and post it on Facebook. Purely decorative, guys. Oh, I know what it was. 
Oh, I, I forgot. Uh, Father Pavone has been removed oh, from the priesthood. Oh, right. Yeah. So Father Pavone was removed from the priesthood. So we're going to talk about that story coming up at 15 past the hour. So join us if you can. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we'll also have a good time on the show today, I promise. Tito Edwards bailed on us today. Pray for him. Hopefully he's getting some rest. But uh, we are going to cover the grave injustice that I am seeing uh, all over the internet. I mean, I've checked, I don't know, four or five sites at minimum, IMDB, Screen Rant, Yahoo, oh, pff, the top 10 list of greatest Catholic uh, Christmas or greatest Christmas films of all time have glaring oversights, massive, huge problems with them. So we've invited Jordan Pacheco to be on the show to address this controversy. Uh, it's going to be on the program, so join us if you can for that. But are you ready, Rudy? I am ready. Uh, you, I are, said are Jordan. Packs packed? Oh, you mean for my vacation? For your vacation? <laughs> oh, it's not a vacation, my man. I'm going over to work. I'm a representative of California. You I know, see. So I have You're to checking in with the home office. I have to go check in. Getting I have your to, shots, uh, masking. Exactly. I have to distance. deliver my report on you guys, the Texans. Uh, <laughs> tell them what I've been seeing. Anyway, if you haven't seen the uh, threat analysis. Babylon B videos on the California yeah. moving to Texas, this, this is, is the, the part. Worst. This is the part of the video. This is the worst. Movie. This is the part of the video oh, where goodness. they move back. To California, right. realize how horrible California is, and then come back to Texas. Exactly, that's the part of this video we're at. All right, well, we're gonna have some fun. It's gonna be a little salty and sweet today. We'll be talking about <laughs> Father Pravone coming up, but uh, we'll have a good time with Jordan Pacheco talking about Christmas movies. Let's pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O oh most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now your headlines with Rudy Carlos. Good morning. Thanks for tuning in to Catholic Drive Time. Today is Monday, December the 19th, and here are your headlines this morning. LifeSite reports Pope Francis laicizes America's best-loved pro-life priest, Father Frank Pavone. According to the Pope's U.S. representative, the order for dismissal from the priesthood was a result of, quote, blasphemous communications on social media and persistent disobedience to the lawful instructions of his diocesan bishop, unquote. But Pavone said that he had no knowledge of the Vatican's decision. Ground News reports, so long, California, major county votes to study secession. The November election saw Californians continue to embrace progressive leadership. That's putting it nicely. But voters in one of the state's most populous counties are so frustrated with the political direction that they voted to consider seceding and forming their own state. There have been more than 220 attempts to break up California over its 172-year history. The Hill reports Biden administration to buy 3 million barrels of oil to replenish reserves. The Department of Energy will purchase 3 million barrels of oil to replace withdrawals from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve amid high energy prices. The purchase follows a bidding process that began back in October to buy the oil for less than the average price it sold for. In Breitbart reports, El Paso mayor declares disaster over migrant border surge and the end of Title 42. The mayor of El Paso declared a disaster due to humanitarian, security, and economic crisis resulting from mass migration through the city. Thousands of migrants continue to cross from Mexico into the city in advance of the end of Title 42, the protocol which is expected to end on Wednesday. And those are your headline news this morning. God love you. The saint of the day, or should I say saints of the day, are the Vietnamese martyrs Pope Urban V and Pope, I'm going to, don't know the what pronunciation is the right one for this one, Anastasius or Anastasius I. The Vietnamese martyrs are St. Dominic Uy and St. Thomas D. The Vietnamese martyrs were both tertiaries of the Dominican order. The St. Dominic, well, he was strangled at the age of 26. He was a, and St. Thomas was a Vietnamese tailor who entered the Dominican tertiary. He was arrested on the charge of giving aid and shelter to foreign missionaries. He was also strangled. They were both canonized in 1988. 
Pope St. Urban V was born in 1310, and in 1362, he was elected Pope, and he declined the office. When the cardinals could not find another person among them for that important office, they turned to a relative stranger, the holy person we honor today as Pope Urban V. The new Pope Urban V proved a wise choice, a Benedictine monk and canon lawyer. He was deeply spiritual and brilliant. He lived simply and modestly, which did not always earn him friends among clergymen who had become used to comfort and privilege. Huh. <laughs> interesting. Still, he pressed the reform and he saw to the restoration of churches and monasteries. Except for a brief period, he spent most of his eight years as Pope, living away from Rome at Avignon, the seat of the papacy from 1309 until shortly after his death. Urban came close but was not able to achieve one of the biggest goals reuniting the Eastern and Western churches. As Pope Urban continued to follow the Benedictine rule shortly after his death in 1370, he asked to be moved from the papal palace to the nearby home of his brother so he could say goodbye to the ordinary people he had so often helped. He died on December 19, 1370. Pope St. Anastasius I was among the first to condemn the works of origin. He was elected to the papacy in 399 and was a Roman by birth and little to, is known about his early life. In 400, he arranged a council to consider the writings of Origen, and after receiving a letter from Patriarch Theophilus of Alexandria expressing strong doubt about Origen's fidelity to the Christian teaching, the council condemned Origen's work as heterodox, and Rufinius of Aquileia wrote to the Pope to defend his translation of Origen's first principle, which St. Jerome had attacked. Pope Anastasius upheld the council's decision, and he also urged the church in North Africa to continue its struggle against Donatism. He instructed priests to stand and bow their heads as they read from the Gospels, and among his friends were Augustine, Jerome, and Paulinus. Jerome speaks of him as a man of great holiness who was rich in his poverty. He died in Rome and is eventually buried in the catacombs of Pontienne. He died on the 19th of December, 401. The Vietnamese Dominican martyrs, Pope Urban V and Pope Anastasius I, pray for us. Praise be to God in all things. The gospel today comes to us from Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the priestly division of Abijah. His wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both were righteous in the eyes of God, observing all the commandments and ordinances of the law blamelessly. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Once, when he was serving as priest in his division's turn before God, according to the practice of the priestly service, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord to burn incense. Then, when the whole assembly of the people was praying outside at the hour of the incense offering, the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right of the altar of incense. Zechariah was troubled by what he saw, and fear came upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall name him John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of God. He will drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Ghost, and even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers towards children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous to prepare a people fit for the Lord. Then Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel said to him in reply, I am Gabriel who stands before God I was sent to speak to you and to announce to you this good news, but now you will be speechless and unable to talk until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be filled at the proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and were amazed that he stayed so long in the sanctuary. But when he came out, he was unable to speak to them and they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He was gesturing to them, but remained mute. 
Then, when his days of ministry were completed, he went home. After this, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she went into seclusion for five months, saying, So has the Lord done for me at a time when he has seen fit to take away my disgrace before others. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. That's a big one, huh? Uh, St. John remains in the forefront. It remains placed before us by Holy Mother Church in this season of Advent. Ignatius Catholic Commentary today said, unlike Mary, I want to emphasize that, unlike Mary in the following episode in verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 45, Zechariah is hampered by doubt and does not receive the good news with faith. God strikes him mute as a temporary sign of discipline. Did you catch that? Ignatius Catholic Commentary, I think, points that out very well. Unlike Our Lady, she had no fear of this angel. She did not have hesitation at seeing an angel, unlike Zachary, the shepherds, Daniel the prophet, John the apostle, all of which see an angel and they fall to their face. Not Our Lady. Uh Uh-uh. It's the message that Our Lady focused on, not the angel, unlike Zachary. Hey, we'll be right back. Father Frank Ravone and what's concerning us coming up next. Protestants like to use James 2, 10 through 11 against the Catholic doctrine of mortal and venial sin because James says whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. But James can't be denying the doctrine of mortal and venial sin because in 115 he affirms it, saying that sin in its beginning stages doesn't bring death, venial sin, whereas it does in its more mature stages, mortal sin. The point James is making in James 2, 10 through 11 is that we must keep all the commandments in order to avoid incurring the guilt of transgressing the law. We can't say to the Lord on Judgment Day, Lord, I only broke one commandment but kept the other nine. So James 2, 10 through 11 is simply a misfire in trying to take down the Catholic belief of mortal and venial sin. I'm Carlo Broussard with the ready reason for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com. Years ago, when I started acting, modeling, and singing in Mexico, my Catholic faith was not the center of my life. It took me many years to discover that success, fame, money, and all the pleasures of the world were not going to fulfill me. I got to a point in my life where I thought I had everything, but I realized something was missing. Thankfully, I began a faith journey that brought me back to God and the home to the Catholic Church. You can too. Discover more at catholicscomehome.com. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. Keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. I don't think we can tolerate this any longer, to be honest with you. I think the moment has come. We have reached the hill to die on. It's this far and no further, brothers and sisters. We must stand on this hill and stand to the very last. Die Hard is not a Christmas movie. Okay. What? It's an Advent movie. We can't tolerate this any longer. We're going to resolve this issue uh, coming up at, at uh, 35 past the hour, Jordan Pacheco, who works for uh, the Augustan Institute. Some say the Glad Trad podcast, but do they really work? That's the question in my mind. But nonetheless, uh, we're going to talk about the top 10 greatest Catholic, or not? they're not Catholic. None of these are Catholic. The top 10 Christmas movies of all time and why there are some glaring omissions in some of these lists. Uh, Jordan Pacheco, who is a, a film aficionado, will join us for that fun conversation. But there are lots of stories in the news that are of great concern to me, and I'm sure they are to you as well. Father Frank Pavone canceled from the priesthood? W- removed from the priesthood? Really? What could be the issue here? Father Frank Pavone gets removed from the priesthood, but Father, what's the guy's name? Rupnik, the Jesuit who molested nine uh, nuns, gets, to, gets, gets his excommunication lifted within hours from His Holiness Pope Francis? Father James Martin gets to continue on. I mean, there's just so many stories we might go to and say, like the, the priest in Italy who did the flotation mass out in the Adriatic Sea where teens were in, like, very scandalous bathing suit material. Like, this is okay, but Father Pavone gets removed from the priesthood. Let's conversate about that. Here's the article that I saw out of the Catholic News Agency. Headline says, Vatican dismisses Father Frank Pavone from, from the priesthood. <clears throat> This story broke on Saturday, by the way. How many stories break on Saturday? Just curious. 
the ones they want no one to talk about? Yeah, there's a, there's a clue right there. Uh, but here's a little bit of the article. Father Frank Pavone, a well-known pro-life activist and national director of the organization Priest for Life, has been dismissed from the clerical state for blasphemous communications on social media and persistent disobedience of the lawful instructions of his diocesan bishop, CNA, has learned. In a December the 13th, and the dates do matter here, that in a December the 13th letter to the U.S. bishops attained by CNA and confirmed by multiple multiple sources as authentic. Archbishop Christophe Pierre, the apostolic nuncio to the United States, wrote that the prefect of the dicastery for the clergy issued the decision on December the 9th, adding that there was no possibility of, of appeal. All right, so the dates matter. The issue, the decision comes down December the 9th, December the 13th, a letter goes out to the bishops article goes on to say, Father Pavone was given ample opportunity to defend himself in the canonical proceedings, and he was also given multiple opportunities to submit himself to the authority of his diocesan bishop, explains a separate statement attached to Pierre's letter. It was determined that Father Pavone had no reasonable justification for his actions. Pavone, however, told the CNA uh, Saturday that he had not been notified about the Vatican's judgment. Could you imagine? December the 9th, the letter, the decision comes down. He doesn't find out until December the 17th. If you are removed from the priesthood, you don't have faculties. You can't say a legitimate mass. You can't hear confessions. What does that mean for anybody he provided sacraments to during that time that he was unaware? Now, Adrian, could you play that clip for me? This is a clip from an hour and 45 minute video response Father Pavone provided on his YouTube channel and on his uh, Twitter feed. Adrian? That's all. <clears throat> and they always try to complicate it and make it mysterious. They'll say that I did blasphemous communications on social media. Yeah. I went overboard with one person. It wasn't even a post. It was a response in a one-on-one in a, in a -on -one communication. And I was mad, and I had good reason to be mad, and I used the, the term uh, uh, GD. Sorry, I went to confession. Keep playing. You see, it's not about that. They just want to find some excuse. Throw Father Frank out of the priesthood. Tell you a story. The Bishop of Amarillo, some of you were asking, well, who is this bishop that's been causing so much problem for you? Um, the, the Bishop of, of Amarillo, Texas. He's, this, he's in his final year there anyway as bishop, but uh, Zurich is his name. And he called me into a meeting five years ago. He was, you know, complaining about my work like he always does. And he said, um, he said, well, you know, you, you, I don't want you doing this, uh, doing this work. And I said, well, you want me in the diocese? You want me to do, you know, you want to give me an assignment in the diocese? Is there any benefit to me being in the diocese? And he said, no. So he didn't want me doing work in the diocese, and he didn't want to let me do work outside the diocese. And I knew this already. So I said, well, you want me out of the priesthood, don't you? Now, there were other witnesses in this meeting, and I can tell you who they are, too. And they know, and they remember this. And he said, never, never, twice, out loud, never, never. I would never want you out of the priesthood. This is my bishop talking to me. Never, never. Remember that, bishop? I'm sure he'll see this video. Never, never. This is in 2017. A few weeks later, after that meeting, I get a letter from him saying, I want you to request to be dismissed from the priesthood. And if you don't request it, I'm going to request the Vatican to dismiss you from the priesthood. So there is an ongoing history here between Father Frank Pavone and the bishop in Amarillo, Bishop Zurich. It goes back many years, in fact, and uh, the article at CNA points this out. Uh, in 2008, when that bishop uh, came to that diocese, there was al already some uh, conflicts there. In 2011, 2012, Father Pavone gets recalled to the diocese, and there was restrictions placed upon him. Apparently, the Vatican got involved, and some of those restrictions did get lifted, and he was able to go back to work. Now, Father Pavone tried to uh, get, uh, you know, switch dioceses. He tried to go to Colorado Springs, apparently. Uh, it's unclear exactly how successful that was, because clearly 
this decision has come down because of repeated and ongoing conflicts between Father Pavone and the bishop in Amarillo. And there's two sides to the coin, to be sure. There's another side to this. I'd like to play another clip. This is from Father Imperato. And by the way, truth in advertising, we've had Father Frank Pavone on this program a few times. We've also had Father Imperato on this program a few times. Father Imperato worked for Father Pavone for a while. Would you play that clip for us? I you that what happened does not surprise me. What does surprise me is it didn't happen a lot sooner, right, a lot sooner. Uh, and I am a little bit surprised about the way it came down. But at the same time, I, the whole honest and the whole truth, the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, uh, I don't think you're going to hear from the Father Frank side at all. I'm sorry. All right. I'm sorry. I just, I know him long enough. Uh, I was involved in the organization long enough to know that there's always spin, that there's always a marketing, that there's always a rationalization. Uh, and I think uh, the biggest problem I have, the biggest problem I have, and I confronted Father Frank about this, is the unwillingness to say that I'm sorry, the unwillingness to say that I was wrong. The unwillingness to say, hey, you know what? Maybe I could have done things better. And I had a conversation with him and he got very, very angry at me. My brothers and sisters in Christ. I, that's uh, good right the there. You, we'll link to both of these video clips in, in their entirety so that you could see them for yourselves. But I think that is a good uh, illustration of sort of the other side of this conversation. It's clear to me anyway that there has been a very long track record of, of conflict, sort of a fighting for uh, who gets to decide certain things. In 2011, when he was restricted in, in Amarillo, uh, the arguments were over his financial practices as head of these organizations, Priests for Life and uh, Silent No More and, and all these others. And, uh, and then, of course, now it seems that it's his political uh, ideology, his political bent, his political preferences that seem to be at the heart of the issue. Now, he did use the GD in a response to, uh, to somebody talking about Joe Biden. And he admits that. He admits that in his video. He says, listen, I got heated. I got out of control. I went to confession for that. I repented, received absolution for that. Then he also put uh, the remains of a ba uh, an aborted baby on uh, an altar. Now, the problem is that altar is a table. Uh, it's not like a, a real altar. They use it to say mass there. But nonetheless, maybe that was done in bad taste. Um, the, but I think at the end of the day here, um, when I look at this, as I see both sides of the coin, on one side of the coin, you have a priest who's fighting for what he believes in. You know, he has unabashedly, unapologetically fought against the destruction of human life in the wombs of mothers, in the tunes of millions and millions and millions and millions. The wholesale slaughter of millions, tens of millions of human lives. Uh, should we not get out of control? Should we not get angry? Should we not get heated about that? Um, of course, his political support for Donald Trump got him in a ton of trouble. People did not like that. His outspoken uh, criticisms of the Democrat Party got, has gotten him in a ton of trouble. And again, I think that's at the heart of the issue, to be sure. The other side of that coin says, listen, priests cannot be kites flying in the wind. Priests are, are to be under the authority of their bishop. The bishop is the minister of the diocese. The bishop has priests working to assist him to provide the sacraments for the faithful, priests should not be little islands to themselves. There's also the, 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 the issue of the celebrity priest. I mean, we, we can all remember Father Karapi. Father Eitenhauer is another good example of that. You know, uh, it's dangerous being a celebrity priest. Just ask one. Ask Father Leo why he left his diocese to go do his thing. It's dangerous. He has to walk a very fine line. He has to be careful. He has to, you know, guard his, his, uh, himself against certain temptations that will be prevalent to the celebrity priest, especially celebrity priest who does not live in community. There are dangers there, and I think that's what Father Imperato is referring to. So it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword. There's two sides to this conversation. And ultimately, Father uh, Pravone has been the master of his own destiny in all, all of this. But at the end of the day... What do we see here? We see a great hypocrisy. Put anything Father Pavone has done 
uh, on hold for just one second. Any, any wrongdoing on his part, disobedient, fighting against his bishop, let's just say, to maintain that, uh, maintain that control over his world and not give that up to somebody, especially somebody who doesn't agree with him. <clears throat> Put that to the side for a second. The late faithful are seeing great hypocrisy. We see a priest like Father Pavone, in spite of what he's done, being censured to the point where he's being removed from the priesthood. There's a great article from Father Gerald Murray on the canon law of the circumstances. Blasphemy, by the way, does not constitute removing someone from the priesthood. Very interesting. Disobedience can, though. Disobedience surely can. Maybe I will link to that article as well. But Father James Martin every day seems to embrace heresy. He gets away with it. Father Rupnik, the Jesuit who molested nine uh, nuns back in the 90s, his excommunication was lifted by His Holiness himself within hours. He gets to continue on in good standing. But Father Frank Pavone, with his many sins that he has repented of and confessed, and maybe, maybe, just maybe, his ongoing control issues, he doesn't get to continue on. There's a hypocrisy here that is unjust. Let's pray and fast for Father Pravone. Let's pray and fast for Holy Mother Church. And those that make these decisions, because they do have authority. They have authority, and that's true. But that doesn't make it right. Hey, we'll be right back. Let's talk about Christmas movies. It's all coming up next. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Christmas Minute. G.K. Chesterton says that it is in the old Christmas carols that date from the Middle Ages that we find not only what makes Christmas poetic and soothing and stately, but what makes it exciting. The exciting quality of Christmas rests upon a great paradox, that the power and center of the whole universe may be found in something very small, a baby in a manger. And it's extraordinary to notice how completely this paradox of the manger was lost by the brilliant theologians, but was kept in the Christmas carols. The songs recall the main point of the story, that God once ruled the universe from a stable, and that the hands that made the stars were too small to reach the huge heads of the cattle. Want more than a minute? Chesterton.org. I'm Debbie Giorgiani. And I'm Adam Bly. We're the hosts of The Spirit World every Saturday morning on the Guadalupe Radio Network. Join us as we help answer your questions on angels, demons, and how the physical and spiritual worlds interact. That's The Spirit World from the Station of the Cross Studios every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Central, right here on the Guadalupe Radio Network. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. And now here's a couple more headlines. Well, rather, here's an interesting story from Catholic News Agency. The headline is, How the Posadas Before Christmas in Mexico Originated. In the days before Christmas, the traditional posadas are usually celebrated in Mexico, recalling the difficulties of St. Joseph and the Virgin Mary in finding a place for Jesus to be born. How did this custom come about? Well, they say the Augustinians discovered that the indigenous people celebrated the birth of the sun with songs and lights in the month of December. So they decided to compare Christ to the sun and teach that Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord, is the true son of truth and justice. In this way, the Catholic priests gave them a new meaning, accompanying Mary and Joseph on their pilgrimage to Bethlehem looking for lodging. However, it would not be until 1587 when Pope Sixtus the, the sixth, the fifth rather, granted a special permission to Father Friar Diego de Soria to celebrate nine evening masses leading up to the days before Christmas. That was the time that tradition began. Thus, the Posadas began with the celebration of nine Masses from December 16th to the 24th. Later, other elements outside of the church were added, such as the procession with the pilgrims and the singing of the Marian Litany and the request for an inn, a Posada, and the Piñatas. Today, the procession, or Caminita, involves a reenactment of Mary and Joseph's search for an inn. People hold lit candles and sing hymns. The group either carries figurines of Mary and Joseph or has kids dressed up as them. 
Neighbors coordinate so that the group will attempt to visit several homes but be turned away, as there will be no room in the inn for the Holy Family. Finally, a home welcomes the couple and everyone sings in unison as a door is opened. Enter, holy pilgrims, receive this corner, for through this dwelling is poor, though this dwelling is poor, rather, I offer it with all my heart, O graced pilgrim, O most beautiful Mary, I offer you my soul so you may have lodging. And those were your headline news this morning. God love you. Praise be to God in all things. Don't forget, uh, I, I sent the CDT Insider email out on Friday, and I'm giving away the Lego book today uh, on the Holy Mass. Great book, by the way. And uh, somebody's going to win that today. So if you have not yet followed those instructions, go to that email, pull it up, follow those instructions, and you get your opportunity to win that book free, thanks to Sophia Institute Press. If you are not on our email list, well, let me encourage you to jump on. Go to grnonline.com forward slash CDT to look for the, the insider email list. There's a link there. Click on it. It takes just a moment to get signed up, and we send you free stuff, goodies, fun stuff, encouraging stuff, inspirational stuff, just to say thank you. Go to grnonline.com forward slash CDT. Speaking of goodies, uh, Jordan Pacheco's here uh, from the, uh, the so-called Glad Trad uh, podcast, allegedly. <laughs> Good morning to you, Jordan. I tease. Well, I tease. Merry Christmas, everyone at it's not, Catholic it's Drive not, Time. You guys are absolutely Christmas. awesome. It's not Christmas, Jordan. I don't know what you, what, oh. are you, what are you what are you what are you what are you doing, bro? Modernist. I'm such here. a dirty modernist. Right now. Yeah, like, did you? <laughs> let me guess. You've already decorated your house. You've already put up your Christmas tree. What? How dare you, sir? Actually, we just chopped down a Christmas tree yesterday. Really? Thank you. A good Christian. <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> well, there you go. Not a modernist. Confirmed. Confirmed. <laughs> Praise be to God. Well, it's good to see you. Uh, thanks for, for hanging out with us today. Uh, so we're going to do a couple of shows this week. They're going to be very Christmas-themed and oriented, and this is going to be one of them. Uh, Christmas movies, greatest films of all times. Uh, it came up in my mind. I know that you're a uh, you're a cinephile. You you love movies. Uh, you work for the uh, Augustine Institute. You help edit films, and uh, I'm a big fan of the Augustine Institute's form. There's a lot of great content there that I'm a big fan of. Praise be to God. But I was looking at these lists and I saw a couple of glaring oversights, and I wondered if you had in your mind like a list of the greatest Christmas mo movies of all time, because I wonder if you are as equally heretical as these that I'm seeing. And I wanted to compare and contrast. <laughs> so, like, off the top of your head, what would you say are, like, the top greatest Christmas movies of all time? Well, it's obvious, and in fact, been sanctioned by the church that Die Hard, of course, is the best Christmas movie. Okay, and he's canceled. Can we cut him off, <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, do me a that's favor. simply incorrect, yeah. because Die Hard is an Advent movie. What? Think about it. Okay. Think about okay. it. It happens it before be Christmas, Christmas, and mm -hmm. it's, it's a penitential because he's suffering, mm. he's getting ready for the Christmas mm. season. You know, I appreciate that, but at least we acknowledge that it's in the it's in the it's in the lead up to Christmas. Okay, so yes, obviously, if you don't have Die Hard up there, um, I think that the greatest. If you, we don't have Die Hard, I think the greatest Christmas movie for us is It's a Wonderful Life. Of course, I think that that I is like, so. like the quintessential. Um, every year I watch it, I just find something so beautiful about it. Right, the, not just the joys of experience Christmas, but obviously the importance of uh, of family. And I wish that yeah, obviously like if you want something with more religious undertones, uh -huh. um, but there's a lot of depth to It's a Wonderful Life. I mean, it's amazing. Like Houston killed it easily. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Well, let me give you some examples of what I mean by glaring oversight here. So okay. uh, the IMDB uh, put up a list of the top 40 greatest Christmas films of all time. Coming in at number 10 from 1984, Comfort and Joy. Uh, by show of hands, how many people have ever seen and or heard of the film Comfort of Joy? No one. Uh, I haven't either. No one. So, mm -hmm. not sure. I, I saw it three times yesterday. What are you talking You're about? Right. <laughs> You're the only one that's on three people that watches that. Number nine, Carol from 2015. Yeah. Carrie? Uh, oh, Carol. Carol. <laughs> Carrie. Oh, yeah, no. Not, not Wasn't Carrie. that a horror film? <laughs> yeah. 20, 2015. Nobody watched that. Like, oh, goodness. Yeah. doesn't exist. Like, who's in charge at the IMDb? Like, what? Nobody's ever. Die Hard at number eight? That's, that's ridiculous. Oh, that should be way higher. Oh, heretics all. Blasphemous that it's even on the list. I mean, yeah. Dude, right. Shame on <laughs> all of you movie. for. Yes, not a Christmas it's movie. It's an Advent movie. It's, uh, it's a documentary for starters, but nonetheless. <laughs> uh, number seven, coming in at number seven, Bad Santa from. What on earth? Oh man, that's a oh, horrible goodness. movie. Uh, that's a terrible. Who movie. writes this crap? Bernie Mac, though. Uh, so that's a classic. The Bad Santa, 2003. Uh, coming at number six, A Christmas Story. Now okay. I can okay. see why this made the list. At least that's, that exists. 
Yeah. So I don't really like Christmas Story to be honest. 1983. It is a class. It's. I think it's. I don't know. Now that I'm like older. Wait, are you kidding? It was filmed in 1983. Yeah. I thought yeah, it was way older than that. Released. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, everybody refers to this. It comes up every Christmas. It's pop culture. It's definitely a part of the cultists of Christmas movies. So I can see why it's on the list. It's not my favorite, but nonetheless. Number five, 1940, The Shop Around the Corner. I haven't heard it, but yeah. it's really good. Yeah. How, how did this yeah. make the list? I mean, so you see, this is like a film snob. This is someone who didn't want to be like mainstream. They're like, I'm going to find some obscure stuff. Right. Uh, okay. <laughs> this is like the top five. No, I haven't even heard of that one. Number four, A Christmas Carol. I'm glad. Wait, which version? Uh, that's, which version? Therein lies the trick. 1951 version. The 1951. Okay. So what is your. That's acceptable. What is your favorite version of A Christmas Carol? Well, if it's not that one, it's easily a Muppets Christmas Carol, obviously. Oh, that one's, that one's actually pretty good. How did this guy make our show today? I'm just curious. I bribed. A lot of bribery. <laughs> a Muppets? You, that's your favorite version of a Christmas Carol? Well, if it's not the 1951, listen, I'll go with my Muppets anytime. You better believe it. Okay, can I put up something sort of scandalous then? No. To you, to, uh, to, has it stopped to, you yet? To consider? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the uh, let's see. Uh, out of all of the Christmas Carol versions, and there's probably got to be, what, 100 versions? At least this. seven. Uh, you know, uh, the guy who played Patton was probably among my favorite version of, of A Christmas Carol. Ooh, George C. Scott played yeah, That's awesome. He did. It fa- I, lo- I really much like that one. But I have to say, every year we probably watch the animated, the live action, the live anime, like the, the anima, not animatronics. Oh, an that 3D one. Polar Express animation looking one. Jim Carrey animated. Uh, it's got to be one of my favorite versions. Mm-hmm. Although they're very critical of religion in that, I would say, in general. Mm. There's subtleties that are like jabs, like jabs thrown in there. But it's just, I think, very good storytelling in there. But uh, you, it's, you're still holding on to Muppets. Yeah. Yeah, mostly because if, if the version of Christmas Carol you're talking about, is it that one with like the weird like 3D kind of animation that hasn't aged very well? Yeah. Um, I, it's because I don't want my children to cry when I'm trying to teach them some <laughs> themes for Christmas, you know? So. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. Christmas Carol 1951 at four. Number three, Miracle on 34th Street. Okay. Okay. Acceptable. Mm. Acceptable. It's a classic. It's part of the cultists. Mm-hmm. It makes sense. Uh, coming at number two, clearly and obviously a rated it R better film. better not say Tangerine. Tangerine. <laughs> From what 2015. I don't even that? know what this is. Who makes this list? A Who prostitute is? tears through Tinseltown on Christmas Eve searching for the pimp. Who broke her? Heart. Nobody saw that movie. What? <laughs> Nobody saw that. Movie. It was it was shot on an iPhone. That's important. Oh, no. Was it really? Are you being yeah, serious? Yeah, that was why. Like no one saw it, but everyone was like, "Oh my gosh, it's so cool because it was shot on an iPhone." Wow. When I was in it LA. grossed 0.7 million dollars. Didn't even hit break a million. <laughs> and this is number two on this <laughs> yeah, IMDb list. And then okay, coming in at number one. It's a Wonderful Life. Duh. I want to point out, you can see the contrast of civilization. It's a Wonderful Life. Number one, everyone goes, yes, that makes a lot of sense. Number two is freaking Tangerine. <laughs> yeah. Like, what a degenerate society we found ourselves in. If right. Tangerine apparently makes a number two list casually. Yeah. Duality of man. Now, what, would, what, uh, what, uh, what film do you think ought to have been in the number 10 that wasn't listed? Oh, dear. Um, oh, Christmas man. Film. Okay. So, this is going to sound funny, but I love the Polar Express. What? I just think... I know. This I know that's like heretical to number say because I'm talking about Jesus. Honestly, it's very important to have Christ. Um, I suppose I like if I like it too, I would have said Adventus. Shameless plug for where I work. However, that's an Advent thing, so I can't even. I can't even do that. So yeah, you know, I agree with with the uh, with the idea of Polar Express being up there. Why? I really enjoy <laughs> Polar Express. Why? Just because I enjoy it. I like it because it's entertaining. I, it's entertaining, Got and it. the the songs are so uh, catchy. Mm-hmm. The, right. The, the uh, hot chocolate song. So oh, good. Gosh. So good. <laughs> <laughs> where's, where's Charlie Brown Christmas? Oh, uh, where's Charlie yeah. Brown Christmas on this list? That's yeah, a good point. That's exactly the issue. So uh, looking at glaring oversights from some of these lists, and I wonder, dear listener, if you might have your favorites, uh, you can always leave a comment on one of our live video feeds. That's uh, one great way. Plus, in the after show, we'll carry on some of these conversations. But coming up after the break, I'm going to read another top ten list for you to kind of round things out. This one is from the Federalist Society. We'll get Jordan Pacheco to comment on that. But if you've not been to Formed, can I encourage you? Go to Formed. There is some beautiful, beautiful family entertainment there that you should check out. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. 
Hey, Donnie, when we see Christ on the cross, what do we call that? A crucifix. And who said, preach Christ and Him crucified? St. Paul. As parents, we're the primary educators of our Catholic faith to our children. And if you don't know your Catholic faith as well as you should, that's okay. Just tune in daily to the Guadalupe Radio Network by logging online to grnonline.com. The Guadalupe Radio Network. Listen, learn, love, and pass it on. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question for your non-Catholic friend. Your only daughter met a fine young man who was a committed Mormon. She now wants to join his church. What's your answer? Well, here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, a reason for no. Doctrinal positions such as the deity of Jesus and the Trinity. Your reason for yes. You deem seemingly moral character as superseding biblical truth. Secondly, orthodoxy. Your answer is probably no. But how and why? Your resistance to Mormon doctrine does not just come straight down from the Bible. It comes from the first five centuries of brilliant theologians, bishops, and popes. These Catholics wrote, debated, and fought for truth. Example, in 250 AD, 311, and 417, three different popes excommunicated three different heretics, Sibelius, Arius, and Pelagius. They denied the Trinity, the eternal deity of Jesus, or taught that human yeah. effort warranted salvation. Would your pastor excommunicate a heretic? Well, unfortunately, your pastor can only remove someone from his local congregation. But that's okay. That guy will probably end up being welcomed at a church down the street. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Uh, stick around for the after show next day. We're going to have a great conversation. I want to follow up on the Frank Pavone story with reading a little bit of the insight into canon law from Father Gerald Murray. Uh, I'll be bringing that to you in the after show. So do join us if you can, or maybe at the top of the next hour, I could do that as well. Uh, but that, uh, that'll that be coming up. Jordan Pacheco is our guest right now. We're talking about Christmas movies of all time. One of the greatest scandals, I think, in the history of our current age is uh, the fact that uh, Carol is considered the greatest of all Christmas films, according to ScreenRant.com. It got 94% vote there on Screen Rant uh, Carol from 2015. Again, horrible. Hey, Grinch, you didn't mention any Grinch, Jordan. Why wouldn't you add Grinch? Oh, you know, listen, we watched the animated one only a couple days ago, and I went, which, yeah, this which is one? fine. A little boomer, but it's fine. Which <laughs> little boomer? Wow, which one? The one, the old one? Like the well, original? The, yeah, we watched the quintessential one with like the, the, the yeah. main theme, and I love the theme. I think it's such a fun theme. I thought mm. the story itself, so it's okay, it's fine. And then it's for like the Jim Carrey version. Again, it's a fun version, but is it oh, my favorite no. Christmas film of all time? Nah. Mm, I don't okay. like the Jim Carrey version. What about Jingle All the Way? Oh, man. What about, so man, I what about Mel Gibson's the, the Fat Man? Yeah. I don't yeah. know that. That yeah, movie. Yeah, don't worry. It's Where's my Tim Allen Santa Claus? Why are we leaving that on the cold? <laughs> that was Allen. literally my childhood. <laughs> Mel Gibson oh, yeah. is Good the new too. Nick Cage. He comes out with a new movie every year, and it's the same thing warmed over every time. It's, some, <laughs> it's an old guy with a gun. It, it's just, it's nothing creative. But he came out with the Fat Man. The CIA or the agencies have used Santa Claus to, to do some dirty work or something. I don't huh. know. I didn't watch it. It was a waste of my time. Uh, but, uh, you know, so it's bizarre to me. Charlie Brown does make the screen uh, rant list, That's by good. the way. Should. Uh, it's a Wonderful Life is down to number three on Whoa. their list. Little Women came in at number four. Little Women? Over at Screen Rant. That's a Christmas movie? How about this? Nobody's ever Oh, mentioned... my gosh. I forgot Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah, That's the, acceptable. I thought that was a Halloween movie. Yeah, that's a Halloween movie. Is it? Uh, yeah. I, you I'm take your pick. Yes. Take your pick. That's how amazing it is. Take your pick. <laughs> Easter movie. Valentine's Easter movie. movie. <laughs> Easter, really? <laughs> yeah, it's like Easter for like three seconds. <laughs> I have not watched A Nightmare Before Christmas. It's ever, a good movie. Ever. Uh, we already talked about Miracle. Uh, the Grinch. Now, I, I will say on the going back to The Grinch for a second, I, well, my family really likes the Benedict Cumberbatch one that came out a couple years ago. We went to the theater to watch this with our kids. It was family friendly all the way through. They actually play Christian hymns. Uh, they sing Christian hymns in the film. Very well done. Very entertaining. High quality. I, we recommend it for sure. What about Violent Night? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> it's like it's like that. It's like the the Santa Claus movie you're talking about. Oh really? Except uh, it's uh, directed by. Tommy Warcola, and uh, it's supposedly, I didn't see it, I don't watch these kind of movies, but I thought it was funny because it's a rated R, super violent film yeah. about, oh, San, about Santa Claus. Yeah. So. You guys are taking me back, back to the old blockbuster days, you'd go in there, oh, yeah. and Good just, times. there would always be this one weird 
uh, VHS on the on the rack, and it was like a killer snowman. I think. Yes. It was like, which one was that one? Yeah, I, I know remember. exactly what that is. Yeah, have Frosty? you seen that? Frosty, I think, is what it was. Frosty. Was it just called a killer snowman? I know the I know the the, the box. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. yeah, everybody's seen this. It was always at Blockbuster. I can't remember what the movie's called. Let me uh, look it up. Anelia's chiming in online, in spite of what her husband seems to think, as she seems to enjoy this segment. Elf, Charlie Brown, Rudolph, Frosty, Santa Claus with Tim Allen, Polar Express. What, what was the Arnold Schwarzenegger one? Jingle All the Way. Jingle that's, All that's that's the Jingle All the Way. That's called yeah. Jack Frost. Yeah. Jack Frost. <laughs> oh, 1997. Yes. Oh, the best Jack year. Frost. Oh, wait, hold on. That was, uh, that was, uh, who starred in Jack Frost? Michael Cooney? No. My, uh, I have no idea. Scott McDonald. That was like my slightly irreverential Christmas movie when I was okay. a kid. Okay. <laughs> uh, Meet Me in St. Louis from 1944 <laughs> is on the Screen Rant list, I think at number nine. Holiday, no, no, maybe that's number eight. Holiday Inn from 1942, Bing Crosby. I haven't seen that. Maybe you have to check that out. That had Fred okay. Astaire as well. Mm-hmm. It looks like a winner. Uh, a Shop Around the Corner came in at number 10 from 1940. So some old classics there on the Screen Rant list. But there was a Federalist list that I found very, very fascinating. Uh, federal, the Federalist.com, 10 Christmas movies that must be canceled by the end of this year. Uh-oh. Have to be. These insane movies have got to go. Uh, coming in at number one, Elf. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> what did you think of Elf, Jordan? Oh, man. You know, it's, so, it's been so long. You know, every time I see a little scene of it, I kind of get nostalgic, but I'm so worried that my I'm going to watch it. My childhood's <laughs> going to be ruined. <laughs> <laughs> my wife loves Will Ferrell, by the way, but she doesn't like that movie in particular. So I, I think we're in for, for a rough one, I think. I, I think my wife thought it was funny. I liked it. No. I like Elf. Uh, I remember liking it when I was a kid. Let's see if that holds up. Yeah, now, that's true. I haven't seen it in a long according time. According to The Federalist, Elf, on its surface, Elf may seem like your typical happy-go-lucky Christmas tale, <laughs> but when many people don't understand is that the movie is unsavory to midgets or little people. Mm. Oh, <laughs> it, em- true. it employs so them, true. thank you very much. It's important to keep fair employment to come Hollywood. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, Honestly, you, I, you see more midgets union is in not Hollywood happy. than any other industry. Yeah. Well, this is a satire. This whole article is satire. Just, Obviously, just thank you, Federalist. Truth in advertising. <laughs> a Christmas him, Story is on this in. list. Santa Claus is on this list. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is on the Federalist list. National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. What? Is what? That? Oh, I never heard of that one. Isn't now, that wait, bad? <laughs> How come we didn't mention this one in the last segment? What is that movie? It always sneaks in. It always sneaks in. Would, would you consider this as one of the greatest Christmas films of all time, Jordan? Um, I consider it a Christmas film of all time, if that, if that helps anybody. <laughs> it is certainly a Christmas movie. It's a Christmas film. What uh, is this movie? I never even heard of it. Uh, what? Yeah. Chevy Chase? Yeah, it's Chevy yeah. Chase. Never heard of it. What? National Lampoon was like a whole thing before it oh. died and burned in a bunch of oh, mediocre fire. It's the oh. greatest Chevy Chase. <laughs> <laughs> Not even a grand fire. It's a mediocre fire. <laughs> greatest Chevy Bush Chase fire. film of all time. Some would say Fletch, but I would say Spies Like Us. National Lampoon was probably what he's going to be mess, best known for, though. To be mm-hmm. sure. That's a shame because I have no idea what this movie is. So, oh. poor guy. <laughs> You're in for a treat this Christmas season. I ain't going to watch it's it. It's a Wonderful Life, uh, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, Miracle on 34th Street, The Polar Express. Polar There's, Express. And Home Alone. You uh, haven't mentioned Home Alone, Home Jordan. Alone. Oh, that's okay, right. you're right. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do another another heresy right here. But I think Home Alone is better than A Christmas Story. I think Home Alone is actually mm. in my top ten, genuine wow. Christmas movies. I love go. Home Alone. I love Joe Pesci so much. The first one, second one, or the eighth one? The first one and the cameo of Donald Trump in the second one. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> you can get canceled. No, but I, in fact, I was gonna, I was gonna wish you all Merry Christmas, you filthy animals. But I was really worried that someone might not understand, understand that and you might get some angry letters. That's <laughs> what we guess. Yeah. So Home Alone uh, on the list. Uh, so there was another film that my family and I started watching very recently, like over the past five years, three, four, five years, and that is uh, the Man Who Invented Christmas, which is the story of. Of, uh, of how Christmas Carol came to be. And uh, it's a great film, very well produced, very entertaining. Char- it's a, the story about Charles Dickens and how he came to make this story. It is very good. We highly recommend it. Have you seen this film? I haven't touched it. When did it come out? Is it recent? Uh, let me let me look it up. Stole Christmas, or the man, not the man who stole Christmas, the man who invented Christmas, <laughs> and who invent, <laughs> what invented what Jesus? A who invented Christmas. Uh, it's a good film, very good film. Came out in 2017. 
Okay. Christopher Plummer was in this film. Oh, oh, oh awesome. Okay, it, I'm already in. Super good. But it's on the list right now. Yeah. I can't believe this is not on that list. It ought to be. It is so very good. Uh, what else? We had else? to make room for t- Tangerine with the other list. <laughs> yeah, know. clearly. That's why. What about Hallmark movies? Oh, okay. You guys like Hallmark movies? No. Do they okay. have uh, any redeeming quality to them? No. Mm-hmm. Okay, listen, I'm going to say, again, I'm going to say something crazy. Hallmark movies are those things that I may never watch, but the older I get, the more I appreciate how there's a corner reserved for something good, yeah, wholesomely yeah. good like Hallmark. Yeah. So like, we watched, we actually watched one called A Dog Named Christmas, like part of it. And it was actually a good, decent plot about this like dog and this like family that was trying to like mm-hmm. kind of, you know, get back together as like a family unit. And I was like, this is really genuinely nice. And I don't want to say that to my wife or to my, to my bros or anything like that. But uh, <laughs> y'all let this exist. <laughs> okay. Now, oh, okay, we're going to run out of time soon enough. So let me ask you a question. We haven't mentioned too many religious films. Like, out and out, really, like, I, we talked about this the other day, which is what made me think of this topic and having you on, because I was uh, singing the praises of the, uh, the film on Formed that goes to the life of the Holy Family. I like the first half better than, like, the last half of that film. Mm. I am a curmudgeon. I am a snob when it comes to Im- movies that depict Our Lady, and I'm not right. a fan of, like, the nativity I've already spoken my criticisms of Chosen. They have a they have a nativity movie out actually, but yeah. uh, I love the one on Formed. But what do you like? What's your favorite religious a Christmas okay. film? Okay, is it what is it called? Is it not the Littlest Donkey? But there's an animated film um, about that really small donkey that actually ends up being the donkey used by Mary and Joseph. Oh, the one that came out like uh, a year ago, two years ago. Well, I the thought star. it was a little older. Maybe Nestor the long-eared the Christmas star. donkey. It's, it, I think it's an older version is of it, that story. Is I it Nestor the long-eared is. Christmas and, and donkey? I'm, forgive me no. for not remembering, but like that film is the film star. about it, and it's just so nice. It's a nice animated film. My wife and I watched it a year ago um she'd grown up with it and i thought that that was just such an adorably good film the star like straight to the christmas story yeah yeah that's a good one we got that for our kids too the star yeah uh and yeah there's not i wish i wish there were more religious film like expressly religious films i'm I'm the same way you know i'm I'm a very uh the the, the chosen's one i'm like don't talk about there's not really a good nativity one that's grabbed me like through the roof quite you know Mm -hmm. um that's not gonna make me not just put on it's a wonderful life to be honest with you but maybe (laughs) there's a niche in the market there for maybe that's that's the calling Mm. any anybody else have a favorite religious Y'all don't, y'all don't see Nestor the Christmas Donkey? The long ear Christmas Donkey? No, mm, no, no, no you don't like it? No, I haven't seen that one. It's a stop motion movie. It's a, about the donkey who uh, was, has met our Lord. The really? Same, yeah, same Where story. does one find that one? Uh, it's like a 1950s stop motion movie. Really? Mm-hmm. I have to look that one up. Uh, Nestor the long eared donkey, you say? Nestor the long eared Christmas donkey. Nestor the long eared Christmas donkey. That's a long title. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> long title for a long Yeah, donkey. Mary of Nazareth is the one on form that I'm thinking about. What about uh, the little drummer boy? Ah, uh, the animation one from the like the original. Oh, yeah. No. The stop motion? Yeah. Yeah, that's a classic. It's, okay, it's what, fine. What about a VeggieTales, the best Christmas gift? I, we oh, saw I totally didn't oh. think about anything VeggieTales. Yeah. I'd be willing to watch it again. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. It was pretty good. Yeah, that is. I think VeggieTales usually is good from back in the day, so I'd yeah. be happy with that. Uh, I feel like uh, we should uh, we should sue the original uh, creators of VeggieTales because oh. they bankrupted the company. They have deprived us of good quality uh, family entertainment, so we should hold them accountable. It's a good cautionary that. tale to make sure to if it's between religious and greater talent who's secular, keep in your religion. That's what that tale is. Yeah, yeah, for Pass sure. The VeggieTale. <laughs> That's Right. You know, it's yeah, interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I, I wish I w- I'll see what you're talking about, Adrian, because like that donkey movie like sounds familiar too. But man, like, yeah, there's not like a ton of, but like there's theme. Like take Home Alone for instance. And Home Alone, like part of like the the climax is the fact that he makes peace with that old man in that church, right? Where he's the guy's watching his granddaughter. You know? Yeah. And, like that's like a magnum opus part of the film. And I was like, wow, that's like really genuinely nice. You know, it's not like forced in her hand. This is exactly where he ought to be because it's Christmas Eve. Well, I don't know what films you're watching with your family this Christmas season, but hopefully we have uh, we have inspired you to avoid some bad ones, maybe watch some good ones. We'd love to know what you like. You can leave those in our comments, and we'll talk more about it in the after show. God bless you. God love you. We'll see you on the next hour if you can join us. Otherwise, see you back here tomorrow morning. Planning on shopping online this year for Christmas? 
Did you know that you can help the Guadalupe Radio Network when you do your Christmas shopping online? All you need to do is shop on Amazon Smile and 0.5% of your purchase goes to the GRN. Just go to AmazonSmile.com and select La Promesa Foundation as your nonprofit of choice. La Promesa is the parent company of Guadalupe Radio. It's that simple to give some extra help to the Guadalupe Radio Network during the holiday season. I had a personal experience that was life-changing for me. My husband of 21 years decided to leave um, our family, me and my girls, and um, in the midst of the absolute horrible heartache, I happened to be flipping through the radio one day on the AM channel because I didn't feel like listening to music, and I happened to find Catholic radio. And ever since then, I have been tuned in religiously, and I feel like I have a really, really strong pull to the Catholic faith. The Guadalupe Radio Network would like to thank those listeners who have supported Catholic Radio financially over the years so that we could be there when Terry needed us. If you would like to support your Catholic Radio station, please visit grnonline.com and you can click on the Donate Now button. Again, we sincerely thank you for helping us to be there for Terry and everyone else that needs God's love. Each of us will be asked to review the movie of our life and give an account to God. We will sorrowfully relive the bad times and joyfully revisit the good. Thankfully, no matter what you've done, there is hope. Since Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save it. So if you've been away from church for a while, we invite you to come home and find the peace that only comes from God. Visit CatholicsComeHome.org. Are you on the CDT Insider email list? Hi, Joe McLean here. And every week I send you cool stuff straight to your inbox, goodies that you're not going to want to miss. Go to grnonline.com forward slash CDT and get signed up today. Informed and inspired, I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Good morning. Jordan Pacheco was a lot of fun. It's a fun conversation around Christmas movies. But clearly, clearly has no idea what he's talking about about some of those films. Like, what? <laughs> confession is in your future, Jordan. Go to confession immediately. Like, uh, oh my heavens, Polar Express, really? Man. So good. <laughs> That's because you can't hear the bells, dude. I remember That's watching. because you can't hear the bells. I re- Speaking of bells, the bells of St. Mary. We never even mentioned it. Like, what is wrong with us? Oh, man. Bing's rolling over in his grave right now. Anyway, uh, yeah, the Polar Express. I remember watching that for the first time. Like, it was, uh, I was at my sister's place up in uh, Lubbock area. And she had a huge, she had like a plasma TV. And I'm like, ooh, rich people. This is nice. <laughs> And she watched it in three, we had like 3D glasses, and I was like surprised. It actually looked 3D. I was blown away by that. It was super cool. It was, it was advanced for its time. But when you watch it now, you're like, they look like the zombie apocalypse. It looks like, a, like it's not, it didn't age well. The, the animation did not age well. Unlike, unlike Spielberg's 1010, if you go watch Spielberg's 1010, that that quality aged very well, in my opinion. It's still incredibly fun, entertaining, and good quality to watch today. But Polar Express, nah. It was, but it was early. It was, what do you call that uh, kind of, where they, they took all the real actors, they, the actors actually acted all the parts, but they had like these green balls attached, glued to their faces. CGI? No, they call that... Uh, Mocap. What? Yeah. Mocap. Motion capture. Motion capture. Mocap. Yeah. Is that what the kids are calling it these days? Mocap. No Mo- cap. Mocap. <laughs> they call it in the, in the real, industry. For real. So, uh, yeah, Polar Express. But uh, I'd love to know more about what you guys think are fun movies for the whole family. If there's something we missed uh, you, or you have an opinion on something, there's a really leave good it in one. the comments. There's a really good one coming out called Cortez. What? Yeah. Oh, my heart <laughs> it's going to be amazing. My heart just sunk. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Someone beat me to it? You should make a Christmas movie with Cortez. <laughs> with, maybe that's how I can get Mel Gibson to do this. Yeah. Maybe finally he'll be like, yeah, I can get on board with that. <laughs> 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 I already did Apocalypto, Joe. I don't need to make another one. 
So, Fat Man Part 2, Hernan Cortez. That would be fantastic. How Hernan Cortez brought <laughs> Christmas to Mexico. <laughs> Oh, don't get me started. That'd be hilarious. But nonetheless, all right, so today, uh, in this hour, uh, there's several things I want to do. Number one, in the after show, I'm going to give a book away. We're going to give away the Lego book for the Holy Mass. So if you got the CDT Insider email, you know what you're supposed to do. Hopefully you've done it by now. Uh, I'm going to try my best in the after show to actually do it during the after show versus what I promised to do last week and failed to do, but made up for it nonetheless. Thanks. Uh, Clarissa won that book. But uh, she, Clarissa has promised to not participate in this one, <laughs> just to give somebody else a chance <laughs> at winning. Uh, Clarissa is a winner, praise be to God. Uh, but we're going to be giving away the Lego book in the after show, so join us if you can for that. And then, of course... Uh, we are going to continue this conversation about your favorite movies or whatever else you'd like to talk to in the after show. But nonetheless, 15 past the hour, we play our game Fear and Trembling, and we have prizes to give away for those that want to play Fear and Trembling this week. But here's the catch. Here's the kicker. Uh, you do have to be the first caller. That's true. I'll give you that phone number at the appropriate time. Be on standby. But the real catch this week is Rudy is abandoning ship. Goodbye. He is packing his bags. It's over. He is headed back for California. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> it's going it was to a fun Babylon Bee. You're going back a, to Cali? It was a fun experiment. You You're know, going back to Cali? And uh, Nah, I don't think so. <laughs> After going back to Cali, he'll be back in a I'm week. Going, going. How's that back, song go? Back. Uh, going back to Cali. I'm going back to Cali. What nah, song are you talking about? I don't know I what so. you're saying, dude. dude come on. Uh, you must know the song. I don't know that one. I know the other one. What's, just, what's, what's the other one? Well, it's it's not a pro. I don't want to... The LL Cool J one? No, the Tupac one. No, I'm thinking about LL Cool J. Oh, okay. I don't know. I don't know any of this music. <laughs> Come on. So, You're from California. Um, it's required. They teach it in school. Uh, yeah. Yep. So uh, going back to, to the uh, the homeland, mm -hmm. got to gotta file some reports, see some people. Styling, profiling. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. Gonna... Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I feel bad, you know, because... Everybody's like, yeah, you're excited to see family, huh? I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, I'm excited to, yeah, go to the restaurants that we don't have here in Texas. <laughs> I love that. just the food part. The food is just the so food is not I'm that to much you better. don't like California as much as you say you do. Right. Uh, look, all I'm going to say is that Quisados has the best breakfast tacos. I know Texas has this, <gasps> uh, this idea that they, they have the brisket taco. It's mm -hmm. good for breakfast. Nah. Quisados... Is the most incredible taco place. It's incredibly overpriced, but it's so good. And I just can't go wait to, to go just there. go to Brothers Tacos. The tacos are like a dollar down the down the road. Yeah, I don't know. I so don't good. Know. It's yeah. Not the same. I think you could save yourself a lot of trouble. <laughs> He's gonna fly all the way to California. Just, money, plenty of heartache. Great food right here. Uh, yeah. yeah, I haven't found it yet though. No. So have no. you gone to the loop? Who In to the, the loop? loop? No. Why would anyone go into the loop for the good food? Hmm. Ah. Uh, well, I go into the loop for a haircut. Mm, well, we're going to be wishing you the best, <laughs> praying for your family to have a great time hey, back thanks. in California. I suppose if you're going to have a good time, you might as well pray for your good time. Join the insider list. Uh, I'll, I'll post a couple pictures there okay. every now and then. Yeah, on the CDT group uh, on Telegram, uh, we're, which good morning to you. By the way, we're grateful you guys are here. We always love our CDT chat. And it was very lively over the weekend. It was, that, wasn't it? The news of Father uh, Pavone. Uh, which, by the way, so let me, um, there's one aspect I didn't get to in the 15 after segment of the last mm. hour that I want to bring and bring to your attention, but I think is important for the conversation. So as I said in our segment with Father Pavone, uh, on Father Pavone, there's two sides of the coin. Now, here's the article over Catholic News Agency with the headline that says, Canon lawyer on Father Pavone's dismissal from the priesthood. Only the Pope can issue a decision without appeal. Mm. He says, on November the 9th, Cardinal Lazaro Yo Huang Sik, prefect for the Vatican's dicastery for the clergy, dismissed Father Frank Pavone from the priesthood for, quote, blasphemous communications on social media and persistent disobedience of lawful instructions of his diocesan bishop, close quote. The decree shared with U.S. bishops in a letter dated December the 13th, written by the Apostolic Nuncio of the United States, Archbishop Christophe Pierre precludes any possibility of appeal. 
Pavone, 63, is a longtime national director for the pro-life organization Priest for Life, who is well known for his pro-life activism, politically charged social media posts, and public support of former President Donald Trump. Pavone's sudden la laicization has shocked many Catholics and pro-life advocates. It was huge news. We almost didn't get the news that Argentina won the, the, the football uh, World Cup thing because of this. It was so so monumental. Uh, the article goes on to say, among them, what are the specific canonical crimes with which Pravone was charged, and when and how was he notified uh, that he is no longer a priest? Pravone, for his part, claims he had no prior notification for the Vatican's action until contacted by CNA on December the 17th. Is this plausible? To better understand the church's laws and judici judicial processes involved in such a uh, case as this, they contacted Father Gerald Murray, someone else who has been on our program on more than one occasion. Uh, the article says, Ordinarily, it is the responsibility of the bishop of the diocese in which the accused priest is incarnated to investigate <coughs> accusations of blasphemous communications on social media and persistent disobedience of lawful instructions of his diocesan bishop, which are the two reasons given for Father Pavone's dismissal from the clerical state in a communication sent to the bishops of the United States by Archbishop Pierre. The Dawson Bishop, if he finds that a priest is guilty of such offenses, would then refer the matter to the Holy See if he judged that the penalty of removal from the clerical state was the appropriate punishment. The Dawson Bishop cannot, on his own authority, dismiss a priest of his diocese from the clerical state. Now, in, the, in that segment that, I, uh, that we covered this, I played for you a clip where Father Pavone states that in 2017, the bishop made clear to him that he intends to try to have him removed from the, on the priesthood. You can go back and watch that on our YouTube channel, Facebook, or elsewhere. Article goes on to say, furthermore, the Code of Canon Law does not state the possibility the, that the... Let me start over. Furthermore, the Code of Canon Law does not state that the possible penalties for these two offenses include dismissal from the clerical state. Uh, that's important to, to emphasize. The Code of Canon Law, this is according to Father Gerald Murray, a canon lawyer, the Code of Canon Law does not state that the possible penalties for these two offenses include dismissal from the clerical state. Canon 1368 states that a person who utters blasphemy is to be punished with a just penalty. Canon 1371 states that a person who does not obey the lawful command of his ordinary and after being warned persists in disobedience is to be punished according to the gravity of the case with a censure or deprivation of office or with penalties mentioned in Canon 1336. Canon 1336 5, which is not included in the scope of punishments for a violation of Canon 1371, mentions dismissal from the clerical state. Thus, Imposing dismissal from the clerical state for these offenses would require what happened in this case. That is, the issuance of what Archbishop Christoph Pierre, the Apostolic Nuncio to the United States, identified as a supreme decision, admitting of no possibility of appeal. Only the Pope, who enjoys full and supreme power in the Church, can issue such a decision against which there is no possible appeal. Ordinarily, the priest who has received such a penalty is informed in a timely fashion. It would be interesting to know if and when Father Pavone received a copy of the decree in which the supreme decision was handed down and to see if the decree further specified the grounds upon which a decision was reached that he was guilty of blasphemy and disobedience. Father Pavone has been quoted as saying that he only learned of this decision, which Archbishop Pierre wrote was dated November the 9th, when CNA contacted him on the 17th. I find that very, very fascinating. So this, is, this has gone all the way to the top. Pope Francis had to sign off on this. And keep this in mind, as we stated in our 15 past segment last hour, Pope Francis just lifted the excommunication of a Jesuit priest who molested nine nuns back in the 90s. So, and he did that hours after that judgment came through. Just hours he lifted that. And yet po, uh, Father Frank Pavone is removed from the clerical state. Did he do things wrong? Yeah, I believe actually he did. Uh, and we, we talked about that in that segment last hour. We shared both sides of the coin. Um, he repented of the sin of uh, using GD in particular. He talked about using the baby, uh, the aborted baby on the, on the supposed altar, which is a table in his office. 
We talked about those infractions, and there's other issues, too, that go back years, many years, with Archbishop Zurich in Amarillo. So all of that is ongoing and known. But does that equate to him being removed from the priesthood? That's the question. Now, some have said that ultimately this is going to give our, uh, Father Frank Pavone even more opportunity because he will have less restrictions now as a layperson versus a priest. But nonetheless, we are seeing what we said in, the, in that segment, a hypocrisy, a rule, uh, like a double standard. If we're going to apply the standard, then let's apply the standard universally, right? I think that's fair. If we're going to apply these standards to say zero tolerance, remember that zero tolerance we were promised after the summer of shame in 2018, the Cardinal McCarrick story? Remember when we, we, were, we were hoping that we would see a third party independent investigation to figure out exactly how Cardinal McCarrick could become a cardinal so powerful in the church, be suppressed, and then be revived to continue to travel and negotiate the, the Sino-Vatican deal between China and the Vatican? Somehow, some way, he was able to continue his, his work in spite of the well-known allegations against him. Somehow, that was allowed to happen. He is now Mr. McCarrick, but we don't, have any, we, don't have any, we don't have any resolution on that. Did you hear of any resolution? Massive public scandal deserves a response to the public. We deserve to know what the deal is because there's a public scandal involved in that. So there seems to be a double standard in all of this. That the, Recently, the, the Jesuit uh, priest who was excommunicated is a great example of that. But there's tons of other examples that one might bring up to say there seems to be a double standard in all of this. Hold people accountable. Hold priests accountable. True. I realized over the weekend, um, I, I had to remind myself, I should say, that these men are humans. Sometimes I personally can put them on a pedestal and think, them, think of them in perfect ways. The reality is they're just as human and frail as you and me. They get angry. They lose their temper. They, 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 they sin. And they too, like me, get on their knees in the confessional and they beg the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to forgive them. And they are repentant for their sins and they receive absolution. They do penance and they are rectified and reconciled to God. If I can expect that treatment, why can't I expect that treatment for my priest? So there does seem to be a double standard. Let's pray for Father Provone and for those that make these decisions. Hey, coming up, it's time to have a little more fun. We're going to play the game Fear and Trembling. The question is, what will we do when Rudy's gone? Hmm, I have some ideas. I'll tell you about it in the after show. But if you would like to win and you want your chance, call right now. 877-757-9424. That phone number is 877-757-9424. 877-757-9424. First caller gets to play the game. Fear and Trembling is coming up after the break. 877-757-9424. We'll be right back. Why do Protestants not believe John 6 when it says that Jesus' flesh is real food and that his blood is real drink? I don't know. In Matthew 26, Mark 14, and Luke 22, Jesus says of the bread, this is my body. He says of the wine, this is my blood. Not this is symbolic of or this represents. He says this is. In John 6, he repeats himself like he does nowhere else in Scripture to emphasize the fact that he expects us to eat his flesh and drink his blood and that his flesh is real food and that his blood is real drink. Anyone who says he is speaking symbolically and not literally simply is refusing to look at all the facts. Fact number one, the Jews took him literally. We see that in verse 52. Fact number two, his disciples took him literally. We see that in verse 60. Fact number three, the apostles took him literally. Verses 67 to 69. If everyone who heard him speak at the time took him literally, then my question is, why does anyone today, 2,000 years after the fact, take him symbolically? Also in verse 51, of John 6, Jesus says that the bread which he will give for the life of the world is his flesh. When did he give his flesh for the life of the world? On the cross. Was that symbolic? If you think Jesus is speaking symbolically here when he says that we must eat his flesh and drink his blood, then you must also conclude that Jesus' death on the cross was only symbolic. It wasn't really Jesus hanging up there. It was symbolic flesh and symbolic blood. Jesus is clearly talking about the flesh that he gave for the life of the world. 
He did that on the cross. Those who believe he is talking symbolically here in John 6 have a real problem when it comes to John 6, verse 51. Did Jesus give us his real flesh and blood for the life of the world, or was it only his symbolic flesh and blood? A beacon of truth in a troubled world. This is the Guadalupe Radio Network, radio for your soul. Welcome to another round of fear and trembling. (laughs) The Catholic Trivia Game Show that helps you work out your salvation by the seat of your pants. It's a 50-50 chance and prizes are involved. Avoid the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Call now to take your shot. 877-757-9424. And now your host, Joe McClain. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time and Fear and Trembling, a Catholic trivia game show with secrets and agendas that you can't tell anybody ever for, for no reason. Don't stop it. Stop it. Te- don't text them. Just, just keep this between us, right? There are a few things we do on the down low, the QT, right? And uh, number one is teach the faith. So we look for teachable moments in the questions where you might learn something that you did not know before. Praise be to God. Just imagine all of these Christmas parties you're going to, you get to brag, you get to throw out all of this Catholic knowledge that you have learned in fear and trembling. Uh, Praise be to God for that. Number two, we like to have a laugh, a chuckle, a good time. And we love it when our callers laugh at our jokes. I mean, they are required by law to laugh at our jokes, but nonetheless, it's a good time. And then we give out prizes, which means it's a winner for everybody. Okay. Because you could learn, you could laugh, and you could win. And sometimes you can do all three of those at the same time, praise be to Jesus. The kicker, though, the secret sauce is we don't ask the caller the questions. They don't ever need to know the correct answers, but could still win the game. I will, at least for the next couple of days, ask Rudy, and then I'll ask Adrian, one of which will give us a correct answer. The other will give us an incorrect answer. And then the caller will have 15 seconds to make a decision. Whom do they trust more, Rudy or Adrian? Bear in mind, Rudy's going to California. Just take that for what it's worth. <laughs> good morning. And then they go into the cup and they could win. Uh, but anyway, uh, good morning to you, Rudy. Good morning, Joe. Praise be to God. Now, not that you care because you're like leaving us, but uh, what are they going to win? Well, this week we have an extra mm-hmm. every Sacred Sunday Mass journal what? that we're going to give away on Friday. That is amazing. I won't be here. Uh, yeah. I, can't, I can't give any fanfare for it. Uh-huh. But we had a pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, interest in this every every Sacred Sunday Mass journal. So we're going to give away another one this week. And if you're wondering what is this, well, it's it's actually a Mass journal. It has all of the readings. It has a space for you to to write out all of your reflections. And and I'm sure you've been in the position where you're at Mass. And of course, you're paying attention. Yeah. Your, your heart is there. You're okay. participating in the mass, mm-hmm. to whatever that means. Look, squirrel. It, yeah. What? Sorry? Yeah, squirrels. Um, and you get this holy inspiration, and you think, oh, I'm going to write this down. I'm going to write this down. I'm going to remember this after, after mass. I'm going to remember this. It's going to change my yeah. life what as much as it's changing lunch? my life right now. Mm. And then that happens. Okay. That's why these every sacred Sunday mass journals are so cool. It's because there's a place for you to take their the note and put mm-hmm. it in there, and mm-hmm. it's gonna it's gonna help you to remember the readings for the rest of the week. So, all right, well, we're giving that away. Thank you, Catholic Drive Time, for that uh, <laughs> mass journal. <laughs> Those guys at Catholic Drive Time, oh, so generous, so, and know? good looking, amazing, oh, just sh- handsome, wise, yeah, tall, it's true, thin. Praise be to God. Hey, uh, speaking of which, Scott, good morning to you. Good morning. Scott, thanks for being on our show today. Where are you calling from? Thank you for having me. Where are you calling from? Uh, McKinney, Texas. McKinney, Texas. Is, does McKinney have anything that they're famous for? Um, yeah, we're, we're considered uh, natural by nature, and it is actually pretty cool because we actually have rolling hills for the wow. cyclists to understand. Oh, wow. That. That's cool. Praise be to God. And, Scott, real quick before we jump in, greatest Christmas film of all time. What say you? I, I always go with It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah. So, although yeah. I did watch Batman last year, and yeah. um, mm-hmm. I think that new one, um, Violent Night, might be a sequel to it, actually. <laughs> uh, just, like, I couldn't get no gifts. I, I, I somehow doubt that, Scott. But nonetheless, uh, are you ready to play, sir? I am ready to play. Praise be to God. All right. We'll start with Rudy, as is our custom, our church-approved tradition, at least for today and tomorrow. Beyond that, though... 
We just don't know anymore. We just don't know. Good morning to you, Rudy. No, Good morning. No tie. You've been going into vacation mode for weeks oh, now. Oh, man. I am like, ready for a week off. Ready for a week off. Are you ready, sir? I'm ready. Praise be to God. Are you sure? Yes. Are you really sure? <laughs> I'm not ready. Okay. I don't want to I, go. Finally, the truth comes out. <laughs> <laughs> Refreshing. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's ask this question on the list. Right. Uh, Rudy, could you tell me what famous Spanish Catholic soldier wrote Don Quixote. Don Quixote. Well, it happened to be a Spanish chap, as we call them. Oh, I do you. By the name of Miguel de Cervantes. How's it go? Miguel de Cervantes. Oh, okay. Miguel de Cervantes. 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 You gotta have the lisp in there, Spanish lisp. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. Uh, Speaking of uh, chaps, I know Adrian is chapped to hear this question being asked out loud. <laughs> so, Adrian, could you tell me what famous Spanish Catholic soldier wrote Don Quixote? Yes. So, I actually just started reading this book last really? night. Is that true? Yeah, it's true. Wow. And uh, the author of the book mm-hmm. is actually Eduardo Verastegui. You're kidding me. No. Nope. Mind blown. Yeah. <laughs> Years ago when he started writing books yep. and acting. <laughs> all right. So, uh, all right, Scott in McKinney, Texas, known for its rolling hills and beautifulness. You got options here. Uh, who was the famous Catholic soldier who wrote Don Quixote? Was it well, Ed- you know, Eduardo Verastegui, as Adrian says, or was it Miguel de Cervantes, as Rudy wants us to believe? 15 seconds on the clock. Who's right? Who's wrong? Scott, what say you? Well, you know, I, I, I'm extremely jealous of the fact that Rudy gets to go to California and have a real Chileriano. Whoa. <laughs> he probably only understands that. Let's um, go. I'm going to have to go with Rudy. Going to have to. <laughs> yes. Ed- Eduardo. We like Eduardo for other reasons. Just not Don Quixote. Because years ago he started acting. Years ago. Jesus wasn't yeah. part of the center of his life. Yeah, praise be to God. Miguel de Cervantes is the correct answer. Well done. You're in the cup. You could win. Let's see if we can't double your chances with this next one. We're going to go to Adrian first. Oh. Adrian, this is a hard one. Uh oh. Could you tell me the privilege? of a criminal or refugee from secular justice to find immunity in a church co- is called what? What do we call that? When a when a criminal hmm. hides in a church. When a criminal hides in the church. That's called the right of hiddenness. Mm-hmm. The right of hiddenness. Mm-hmm. It's very deep. It is. Very philosophical. It's, it's one might say it's occult. Is it? Uh-huh. The right of hiddenness. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, Rudy, uh, what say you, good sir? Could you tell me the privilege of a criminal or refugee, a refugee from secular justice to find immunity in a church is called what? You know, funny enough, Oh, St. Martin Luther, he did this. Funny, haha. Uh-huh. Uh, actually, not very funny. Okay. Because this is a, a, one of the ways he got away with it. But anyway, it's uh-huh. called right of sanctuary. St. Martin Luther? Did you say St. Martin Luther? Oh, Oops, did, did I say that? Was that allowed? I was being sarcastic. Uh, He's not a saint. I see. Okay. I spit but, upon him. But nonetheless, your answer is what? Right of sanctuary. Right of sanctuary. All right, uh, Scott, you got options. Is it right of sanctuary? That's what Rudy says. Uh, Adrian says it's the right of hiddenness. 15 seconds on the clock. Who's right? Who's wrong? Scott, what say you? I'm going to have to say that Adrian is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can give him a date. I don't know if I can give him a for that. Oh, oh this man. Is like, this is spicy. Go! This is like watching Argentina oh, win what is, over France. This what, is like, what wow. in the disrespect? Wow. Scott, I'm going to drop Scott your call. Scott the prize right now. This is ridiculous. Nail it out. <laughs> The amount of disrespect on this Ooh. phone right now is unbelievable. If I could drop this mic and walk away, I would, but it's on a stand. I can't physically drop it. Wow. But, and uh, the cable's inside of the, yeah. the thing. <laughs> Scott! That is like, mm. that's, like ch- that's like Giga Chad level. <laughs> <laughs> Man! Giga Chad level? All right, you're in for two. You're not allowed to say his slang. <laughs> you're in for two. Uh, I, I, let's just say that this is all just, uh, you know, just going through the routine at this point, because clearly you're 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 the greatest ever to play the game, the goat. But we're gonna try it anyway. Goat? Back to Rudy. Some would say goaded. Some would say goaded. <laughs> Rudy, could you tell me what is the common term for gloss glossalia? 
Glassolalia. Oh, thank you. Glassolalia. Glassolalia. Is that like a no, Selena song? That is Latin for getting a shiner, which means what? getting sucker punched. I see. Yeah. Glassolalia. I got glassolalia. You sure that's not a... I think I've heard that in the top 40... No? Okay. Glossily. <laughs> You're saying getting a shiner, sucker punch. Getting sucker punch. This is a game that kids play these days. Really? Yeah, it's terrible. On TikTok? Let's see. Uh, Adrian, we're going to run out of time here, but could you tell me what is glass alolia? Yes, it comes from the Greek meaning glossa, tongue, and lalia, talking. And so it is speaking in tongues. See how he makes that sound legitimate? Hmm. Uh, Scott, is it speaking in tongues, the gift of tongues, glossolalia? Oh, that's what Adrian says. Whereas Rudy says it's the uh, getting sucker punched, getting a little glossolalia across the eye. <laughs> 15 <laughs> seconds on the clock. Who's right? Scott, what say you? You know, I, I can see that Adrian was feeling very rejected by me, so I'm just going to throw a bone to him, and, and, and we're going to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> you are a kind and charitable soul, Scott. Woo! You went out to the French's and you met him where you're at. I, I you don't know, s- man. You smell like the sheep now, Scott. You might smell a little like Adrian. I'd take a bath if I were you. Ouch. Immediately. Immediately. <laughs> Scott's pretty sturdy. <laughs> Great for me. He's good. Everyone hates me. You are right. It is uh, the gift I, I of I tongues. Love Adrian. Congratulations, Glossolalia. Glossolalia is the gift of tongues. I just want to make sure everybody knows the right answer there. Scott, you were fun. Thanks for playing our game. We're going to put you on hold, but uh, we really enjoyed having you on today. God bless you. All right, that's going to do it for the radio side. Join us in the after show. We're going to get your thoughts on Father Frank Pavone, Christian or non-Christian Christmas movies, or whatever else is on your mind. All of that and more coming up next. God bless you. God bless. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now and God love you. Cut me deep, Shrek. Glossolalia. Is Shrek, is Glossolalia. Shrek, is Shrek a Christmas movie? They have a Christmas movie. Is it well, Shrek? Christmas why didn't movie? we mention Shrek in the Christmas list? It should have been number one, to be honest. It's just really? It's a really good movie. <gasps> it's a horrible film. Dude, dude, Shrek's awesome. Shrek is terrible. It's better man. than that other movie you keep quoting. Which is? Nacho Libre. <laughs> I don't quote it, man. I'm not quoting that film anymore. All the time. I went to time. confession. Good. Yeah. Shrek is way better than that movie. I hate all the Nacho Libres of the whole world. I think he needs to go back to confession. <laughs> but yeah, uh, you guys, have you ever heard of Glossolalia? You know who had that Glossolalia, gift? Glossolalia, apparently, is how you say that word. That would be uh, St. Vincent Ferrer. Oh, yeah. He had the gift of Glossolalia. Yeah, he could it. speak in tongues and everyone would understand him. And not only would everybody understand him and all their, whatever language it was in, mm-hmm. they, he would have crowds of like tens of thousands of people and the people in the very back of the crowd, because he was speaking outside <laughs> in the open air mm-hmm. and he would speak and the people in the back of the crowd could hear him as if they were right next to him. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Glossolalia. How do you say it? Gloss- Glossolalia. Glossolalia. I had literally <laughs> never heard of that ever. So on the fly, messing that up. That's what I do best. That's my strength in life. <laughs> Don't be laughing. T Storm there. said, "Poor Adrian. Must be hard to never be right." <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> Ouch! Dang! Uh, Monica, good morning to you. Sonia, Jesus, Lori, uh, Ma- Maria, good morning to you. Lynn, Mimi, good morning to you. Glad, glad, glad to see everybody here today. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Good morning to you, Patty. Of course. Uh, good morning to you. Gremlins! Don. Monica Cortez at Gremlins. Yeah, I Christmas saw movie. that. That's a good one. I saw that. Not a, I'm not a fan of Gremlins. Uh, a, a, little, great a little too creepy, I think, when I was a kid, thinking Gremlins was a little too creepy. Yeah, is it a horror movie or is yeah. it? It is a horror movie. It is. Yeah. But it's a Christmas horror movie. You know, the thing about horror movies back when I was a kid was they were they were pretty standard fare. You had teen, wayward teenagers having premarital uh, sexual relations, getting drunk. Well, clearly they were going to be all killed. Yikes. In the process. 
You know, they should be killed. I mean, that it. it it's, it's what, the I'm sorry, what? It's the so, just thing to do. Is it? Is it the just thing to do? Uh, very, what? very... Like, what was the first horror film? So now we're going on a tangent here. Horror movies. <laughs> first horror film to, like, break the mold? I don't know. Probably a mold. Scream. You know who wrote a movie about horror, uh, oh, it was like about a horror movies? Scream probably broke the mold because it parodied the horror yeah. movie. Uh, go ahead, Adrian. You know who wrote a book about horror movies? Who? Uh, e. Michael Jones. Really? really? Yeah. And, we just had uh, him on, and he was talking about um, like it's very interesting. Like it's it's a manner of because like, E. Michael Jones has his background is like in psychology and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So he talks about that a lot, and he talks about how the um, horror movie genre is. It's interesting because you know you see in the horror movie a lot of oh, degeneracy, right? Yeah, he you always see these the, degeneracy yeah. things like yeah. people having premarital sex and yeah. things like that. Yeah. But what ends up happening always? They Those are killed. people who die. That's what I just said. Yeah, I know. But it's, it, but it's interesting <laughs> it's psychologically. It's like it's like yeah. the idea of like why is it that the the Hollywood culture mm-hmm. was doing that? They yearn for justice. Isn't Patrick exactly Coffin. exactly that's Patrick what he's talking about. Patrick Coffin has talked about this, and especially in connection to like alien films and creatures. Yeah, you know, and the diabolic and the demonic. Mm-hmm. So Hollywood does have a fascination with the just. The good. It's like because it, it's inherent in you, and yeah. even if you're like degenerate and you hate God and you hate, we should maybe have him back on just to talk. Just about talk that. about horror horror movies. Yeah, yeah, it would be. I a could fun listen to E. Michael Jones. He's. Yeah, I noticed. If I, I if I, I could you, sit I around a list, fire, yeah. look. If I could just if I could curate a uh-huh. fire pit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would have uh, E. Michael Jones would be there. Okay. And then I would have... Uh, no, don't say it. <laughs> Charles Cologne <laughs> would be there. No. Joe, you'd be there, too. You don't say it. You'd be there, too. Charles uh, Cologne, who Michael else would Jones, be? who else? I mean, this is fireside chat. How would who you have anyone there? talk? I, it, they would Between be, the three of them, okay, too much. No one, no, they would be just Listen, all talking at the same this time. This is fantasy fireside. What if time we, does not on, need to be a factor. Hang on, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. So who's on your fantasy fireside? What if, what if we did, like... Mm-hmm. Uh, a fireside chat. Okay. Sorry, Brigger, you were going to steal it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like a series, right? A speaker series where every night you have yeah. people come around the fire and you just hear somebody talk. Marta. Sounds expensive. Marta with, uh, with uh, a lot of firewood. Marta with fire and brimstone. Too much stupid chit chat. Oh, Marta, come on. Marta. We just spent an hour and a half. Martha, Martha, Martha. No, Marta. You, it's Marta. I mean, she's Marta. not wrong. <laughs> okay. You're right. You are right. It is. It is stupid. Marta. But nonetheless, but nonetheless, we. Uh, it's the week before Christmas. We mix it up. What do you expect? On the after show. The after show is expected to be more casual. Just ask around. They'll tell you. It's supposed to be more casual. We do the uh, the more focused stuff during the radio side of our show. In the after show, we are not on the radio, so we get more casual. Ayush Das said... Father Pavone should join the SSPX. No. I gonna highly happen. doubt that. Ain't gonna happen. He's not. A, I, he's not a traditional priest. Yeah, he's not a traditional priest. He doesn't say the yeah. traditional mass. And to be honest, and with you, he, I don't think the society would want him because he um, has no. disobedience problems. Yeah, and they're very, yeah. very strict. They'd, they'd make him go back to seminary. Then they make him go to a society but seminary. The other, the other thing about the Father Pavone story is if you if you re, if you watch all of Father Imbarato's video, it's seventeen minutes. And I linked that. I put it. In, I put it in the chat so you could go watch it. Let me tell you, it could have been eight minutes. It watch could. it. Watch it in double time. That's exactly what I did. Yeah, I watched it twice. Actually, too many pauses. Um, but if you watch Father Imbrato, what he's trying to do is say, read between the lines here. I can't tell you specifics, but I can tell you I know. Um, this he's gonna he's gonna do better as a lay person than a priest. So, in other words. He has built himself a little good thing going on here. Doesn't want anybody else to have control over his baby. And now as a layperson, they definitely won't have control over it. Here's the other thing, too, back to the SSPX thing. What people don't realize, it's not just like a collection of ragtag members. It's This is actually a religious order, and you have to have a particular charism to join. It's not like, yeah. oh, all the cancel priests send them to the SSPX. Like, no, yeah. that's not what the SSPX is. Yeah. It's not It's not this yeah. collection of rebels, okay? Yeah, yeah. By, by the way, just let me for clarify, Marta, we're glad you're here. And we are glad you're here. And we're, we're going to talk about Father Pavone here more. And by the way, that was a scripture joke. But hold on. Uh, let me just say this. If you're just joining us, we did two segments on Father Pavone already in this show. Uh, two on the air. We did one in the first hour, 15 past, and we did another one at the top of this hour. So you can always rewind and watch those as well, so you can get more of our take 
or my take, I should say, on the Father Pavone story. But we'll, we'll continue to talk about it now. As well. Yeah, the other thing is, uh, and because here's another, another thing, and I, I don't mean to uh, be nitpicky, but uh, the SSPX is also not a religious order, it's a society. Of apostolic life, which is like the fraternity. The fraternity is also not a religious order. The Institute of Christ the King is a religious order in a sense. They're they're canons, um, so it's slightly different as well. All these different categories of things, but the fraternity and the society they don't take religious vows. They don't take the ch- vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. So they're more similar to diocesan priest in that sense, uh, except they live in community and have a shared charism, and that's yeah. what unites them. Yeah. But a slight, slight thing. So let us know what your thoughts and opinions are of Father uh, Frank Pavone. You know, I think I'm going to continue to call him Father, uh, just like uh, uh, Father Imperato said, he is going to continue to call him Father as well. I Indelible think, mark on his soul. Yeah, I mean... He wants, uh, you know, you are a priest forever, according mm-hmm. to Order of Melchizedek, right? So, yeah, yeah although he doesn't have sac- he doesn't have faculties, he cannot say the mass now, even for himself. Well, he's not allowed to. He's not allowed to. Um, but nonetheless, I'm just going to continue to call him Father. Now, again, I I see both sides to the to the, the the argument here. I see both sides. There were issues of obedience with Father Pavone. There's, I think it's clear he was fighting to control what he built. And didn't want to give that over to anyone for any reason whatsoever. So there's some definite issues there. Father Eitenhauer, and it's the cult of personality I think is also should be looked at in this conversation. Uh, Father Crappie, huge cult of personality. Yeah. And I can tell you from pers- personal, firsthand experience, because I had to deal with Father Crappie and his organization for a time towards those latter years. So I have some experience there that I can speak of personally. Was this the priest that w- went... And started the the black dog yeah. thing. Yeah. Okay. By the way, uh, d- in spite of what anybody has told you, because I, I I don't know if you guys have heard, but I've had like four people, five people who are like famous, c- popular Catholics. Oh yeah, he's in a monastery. He's this. He's he's not in a monastery. He is not. Okay. I know. I have a personal acquaintance, a friend, who speaks to him on a fairly regular basis by telephone. And he's not in a monastery. He lives in Montana in his little private hermitage under no one's authority, doing his own thing. But he's been laid aside, so he doesn't need to be under anybody's authority. And uh, I don't know if he sold off his Harleys. I have no idea. But apparently he did not sell off his Montana cabin. I would have liked to see Montana. Yeah. You know, here's the thing about, uh, about this. The, there's so many... The, okay, so these kind of celebrity priests. The problem with this is the state of religious communities and the state of, of the world in that sense. Because this kind of like celebrity priest status, the priests who do these public uh, displays, which I think are very, very important. We mm-hmm. need priests to do this. Traditionally speaking, they'd be part of religious orders. Now, Father Karapi was technically part of a religious order. Yeah, however, no, he, no, he was. He was. However, not well, he I was know. I say tech, order, the yeah. reason why I say technically is because technically means actually. He was actually part of the religious order, but he wasn't actually part of the religious order because he wasn't traveling with religious order. He wasn't, he was on his own. He was doing his own well, thing. Uh, can I tell and you, so, I can tell you what happened. Right. Well, I, I was hold on one second. So the idea here is that you're supposed to, in a religious order, when you go and do these kind of missionary things, you travel with other priests yeah. who are part of your religious order, right. and there yeah. are set rules yeah. for missionary priest. So if you look at the rules, like, for instance, the Passionist, they have very strict rules when they go and do their retreats, when they go and do their missionary activity. They're not allowed to st- eat with certain people. They're not allowed to go. And this isn't like a St. Paul, St. Peter type thing where yeah. St. Peter is like, I don't want to eat with you because you're bad. It's like, right. no, you don't want to put yourself in a situation right. where you get a big head, where you get a celebrity status, where you have these yeah. kind of things happening. Yeah. And these religious orders were built and created in order to defend you from this. And now now you have priests that are part of religious orders, they're legitimately part of religious orders, they're doing these things, but mm-hmm. they are not being held to account from the very beginning. And once they get humongous, then the religious order or the local bishop is like, whoa, 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 how did this happen? Yeah. And they step in and it's like, at this point, there are, it's already, you're down uh, the bo- yeah. block, 10 blocks on the road. Yeah, for sure. Uh, they did try to rope him back in. I can tell you that personally. I know that firsthand. Um but he refused to come. He asked to be laicized. They tried to talk him out of it, Father Crappie, and he insisted. And uh, unfortunately, at the exact same time, was another priest of the same order who was my spiritual director at the time, 
also asked to be laicized for very similar reasons. He wasn't at the celebrity status, so that wasn't the problem. But he wanted to be independent. He just wanted to do his thing. He didn't want he didn't want anybody telling him what to do or how to do it. He didn't want to have to live in community. He wanted to be doing his thing. And when that no longer was possible, and they were like, "You got to come back. You got to be in community. You got to be a part of the order, not just a satellite, a kite flying in the wind." <coughs> um, he he asked to be laicized. So it's uh, it was a tragedy to to lose both of those. Uh, for for Father Karapi, you know. He was really out of control. I'm going to be honest with you. I can tell you firsthand stories. But this, one of the tragedies in that story was we, the church lost an effective communicator. Like, he knew how to communicate. Yeah, he was a good speaker. He was a good speaker. And imagine if he could have humbly accepted that obedience, come back to the order, we would still have an effective communicator today. Yeah. We, we are at a loss for that now. Yes, it's really... The Father Eitenhower, do you guys remember Father Eitenhower from uh, pre, uh, the... Uh, what was it? Um, the the pro life organization, international something. I forget the name of it. All of a sudden, off the top of my head, he was do. He was also doing uh, a series on exorcisms and the occult. Well, he got into an, an emotional relationship with a woman, caused a scandal. His bishop recalled him because this is the deal. A priest has to be under a bishop. A priest can't be again a kite in the wind. That's not how it's. That's not what God designed. That's not what Jesus wanted when he created his church. Yeah, the, the priest serves under a bishop, under a superior. That's the design. They're not supposed to be out doing their own thing. So it's dangerous when those circumstances are allowed to happen. They are allowed to happen, but they're dangerous. They can be very dangerous. So Father Eitenauer is out, and he gets into this situation. It's scandal. And his bishop recalls him. He obediently goes back and does whatever the bishop wants him to do. He... You never hear from him again. He is out of the public life. He has been now for many years. Um, praise be to God. I would say that is a good example of what a priest ought to do in humility. And I think that's what Father Imperato is referring to in the Father Pavone case as well. But again, there's two sides to this. Uh, there is an ongoing battle between Father Pavone and the Bishop in Amarillo. The Bishop in Amarillo clearly does not want him doing what he's, what he's doing. You know, quite argue, quite possibly, you can make a strong case that it's because he doesn't approve his politics. Yeah, okay, great. But at the end of the day, he has to be in the authority of a bishop. Now, I don't understand. There is. A, I got to go back and look because I, I I pulled up the example of Father Leo Padalinhug, another popular priest uh, who who asked to be let go of his diocese. He was a he was a teacher. He was a professor at the seminary uh, at, in Emmitsburg, Maryland. And he asked to be uh, released from his bishop. His bishop released him. But he joined... Adrian, can you look at that? Can you go to Father Leo's website? I think he gives an example. What is a, his name? Father Leo Father what? Leo Patalin Hug. <laughs> God bless you. Patalina? He, Patalin Hug. You don't know who Father Leo Patalin Hug is? No. Are you kidding me? No. That's that's crazy talk. I can't believe... Hey, I've you didn't know what Glossolalia was. <laughs> Father Leo Padalina, come on, man. You've heard of Father Leo Padalina. No. Oh, my God. See what I'm dealing with, people? <laughs> Look, uh, I don't know who Father Leo Padalina <laughs> is, and you don't okay, know what Glossolalia is. Uh, it's true, I don't, but neither does anybody else. Uh, on his website, he gives, he gives an explanation of his situation, of like he'd Let's left see. his diocese and he joined. Plating Grace? Yeah. Yes, that's it. That sounds like a... And he joined some sort of community, but it's sort of nebulous and... And uh, I'm not trying to be is critical he, of Father Leo. I'm just trying to say this. He's a cooking. Like what? Is, what is the deal here? I think that these are these are what issues the? the church is facing right now. So if you could uh, scour his website and look for that. But uh, Paul, good morning to you. Nancy, good morning to you. There's she says there's a priest. He's on TikTok. There's a priest who just goes around the world singing and playing guitar. Yeah, there's a lot of those. Alberto, good morning to you. Uh, Albi is a priest member of a community of consecrated life, volun Voluntas Dei. His diverse background yeah. what is as Voluntas an award-winning chef. What is Voluntas Dei? Voluntus, Voluntas Dei. Yeah. While you're looking that up, Marta asks, does anybody know what Father Crappie actually did to get himself in trouble? Oh, there was a lot of things, to be honest with you. Um, the women were involved. Drugs were involved. But disobedience was a big factor of it. The bishop in Corpus Christi required, because the order that he belongs to, or had belonged to, 
was under, and it still is to this day, under the authority of the Bishop of Corpus Christi. The union with the church, the institute invites her members to become a total, to become totally available to the church for any apostolic work. She may require anywhere in the country. Her members involved in many ministries, yada, 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 started Catholic Christians who be kind of on by bishops. Each member wants to take up his or her share of his works, yada, yada, yada. The institute desires, this doesn't say anything. This is nothing. Yeah, it's nebulous. Like, apostolic like, objective, the is apostolic it a community? to create peace and brotherhood in Jesus Christ. Is there a superior? To this is there a bishop? Like, it's um, like, let me detach from my diocese and go join this, this, what seems to me, I'm characterizing this, my own private opinion here. I have no expertise on this whatsoever. Take this for a massive grain of salt. Did he just join some get out of jail free card and let him to do whatever he wants? And then if so, then why didn't Father Frank Pavone try to do that? Back in 2012, 2018, 2019, or whatever it was that the, he says the uh, the Vatican let him uh, overrule the bishop in Amarillo. Which, if they did, if the Vatican overruled the bishop in Amarillo, then why did they still suppress him? At the In the Institute, governance is comprised of the following. They have a director general and his council for the entire institute, a, direct, a district general, a district director and his council for each district, a district formation director, team facilitator, what on earth? Yeah. <laughs> See, it seems and it's like a corporation. It is a corporation. It what seems on earth? Odd to me, but nonetheless, that is allowed to exist. And what I guess my point being Who is allowing them to exist? My point being, I think that's dangerous. I I think we ought to avoid the celebrity priest. I think as priests, they should avoid the celebrity priest. I think those temptations are too great. And the what is the purpose and the role of a priest? To provide the sacraments. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's part of the problem. And ultimately, I think that's part of the, also why Father Imbrato is saying, ultimately, as Mr. Pavone, he will now be free to do as he sees fit. Hey, the bishop in Amarillo no longer has a say over, over him. Do I think they, they, they were rubbing <clears throat> and they were in friction and they were fighting each other? Yeah, of course. Could you say, well, the bishop in Amarillo doesn't like his politics and he, and he just wants to prevent him? Well, sure, that's what Father Pavone actually said uh, was the deal. But at the end of the day, bishops do have authority, whether we like them or not. As Jesus says in Matthew 23 of the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests, they do have authority. You have to listen to them. Just don't follow their example because they'll lead you to hell. But do what they tell you to do because they have authority. So authority matters, even when it comes from guys that are dubious. Hmm. If they have authority, they have authority. So that's the complication in the matter. That's where you have to see both sides. And again, it's clear in my book there's a double standard being, being applied in all of this. So, and Father Pavone got the short end of the stick, as they say. So here's, here's the thing that bothers me about this whole thing. Uh, yes, all everything that's being said is true, but that's not actually the point. No, I mean, there's, there's a, a disobedient priest or a dime a dozen. All these things happen. A priest mishandling money is a dime a dozen. We just reported, Bree Dale reported from Daily Wire about the priest who is selling Vatican art, the, the intellectual property of it, making tens of thousands of dollars or more. Um, at the end of the day, yeah, these things happen. It's bad. It's not good. Here's the real problem. The real problem is this is a, a use this is a, a test case to now apply this to priests who have nothing wrong with them. And they always do this. They always do this. They did this they, Precedent. Both, both in the secular world and in the religious world. And they, they do this. The secular world, what did they do? They canceled Alex Jones off of social media. And every, no one cared. Everyone was like, well, it's Alex Jones. He says crazy things. He has conspiracy theories. When he's also bombastic. We don't even like him anyway. And so nobody came out to defend Alex Jones. Then what do they start doing? First, they, they start for the gypsy. They start banning other people, and then what do they do? They ban Donald Trump off of social media. And then they start banning random Twitter users who are like whatever off of so Twitter, Facebook. Are uh, my buddy um, uh, Josh Patterson? He gets banned off of Facebook like every week for saying super innocuous things. It's ridiculous. That's a precedent. <laughs> the same thing they do in the church. They promote you away to somewhere. Or, in this case, they're setting a precedent now where they're, they're having a canonical trial without you present. 
He's never been given his di- in his exact charges. Yeah. He's giving general charges because now you can say, okay, now I I can now start digging around if things start coming up. Now I can apply whatever it is. And now people are coming up. Well, father did do X, Y, or Z, so it does make sense that he get in trouble. What are his specific accusations? And he said he makes blasphemous commentary. What is a specific accusation? Is it the blasphemy that we talked about on the show? Because that's not actually what they quoted. They just said blasphemous, and we're just guessing. We're saying, okay, it was probably this thing that he said. Oh, it's probably this thing that he did. But we don't actually know. They don't tell us. And this is a big deal, because now they can apply this to any priest. Any priest can be, okay, you did X, Y, or Z. Well, tell me, what exactly did I do wrong? I can repent of it. I can do whatever it is I need to do. Yeah. The response is to just laicize you. And so now he, had, he they said he has no means of, of, uh, of defending himself now. Mm-hmm. He cannot appeal it. That's absurd. That's crazy. And the canonical lawyers are, are chiming in. But ultimately, who cares about canonical lawyers? Who cares about the canon law if it comes down from Rome? Because this order came down from Rome. If they appeal it, what are they going to do? If Pope Francis decides, okay, well, I'm just not going to hear your case. What, who who do you have to hear? Yeah. It'd be like if the Supreme Court well, went all the way to the Supreme Court and ignored this it. Trend. The, the bishop in Puerto Rico dismissed. There was a bishop in Tennessee dismissed. I mean, they don't get reassigned. They just bye, enjoy your retirement. Yep, that's it. I mean, we're so. And how many how many priests are canceled in all of this? I know priest. You know? I know priest who, and uh, this might be slightly scandalous, but I know priests <laughs> who have not been excommunicated. They're in perfectly good standing. They have. There's nothing wrong with them. Yeah. They've never been have any kind of censure whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Who say mass to this day, right. Publicly, but they have no canonical mission because they were just told one day, yeah, don't you're come. you're gone from this from this parish. Yeah, don't. And they're up. like, oh, okay, uh, yeah, yes, your excellency. Uh, so where am I going now? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. So what does the priest do? Well, he continues the work of priesthood. He keeps doing the things he's doing. Now, is that the right thing to do? Is it the wrong thing, yeah. thing to do? I don't know. But it's the reality of the situation. Uh, they're already it's doing these kind of things where they're greatness. punishing you without actually punishing you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I keep pointing this out. You know, I was having this conversation. By the way, if you're if you're new to watching us right now, do us a favor and subscribe, share, like, hit the. That would help us grow uh, we would be very grateful to you. So, uh, you know, send some love. Give us a thumbs up, a rant, or wherever you're watching right now and share us with a friend. That'd be fantastic. But, uh, you know, I, I, I had to remind my wife because it seems it's unjust. It's an unjust application of, uh, you know, in this. There's duplicity. There's, there's hypocrisy in this. Yeah, do I believe a Father Pavone uh, did some things that he shouldn't have done? Yeah, I, I think he did. Do I think he deserves this? No, absolutely not. I don't think that. Um, how can we live in a world? How can we accept that he deserves to be completely laicized for his infractions, which he he did admit to, you know, be getting angry and saying the GD, which I thought was terrible when he said it. To me. Yeah, I, when I remember seeing it, I'm like, what? Well, who does this? Yeah, I would never say that, ever. Like, yeah. I mean, that's no, he should have never done that. Uh, so, yeah, he's done some things. His continued fight in, uh, f- with his bishop over disobedience, that's a problem. It is a problem. Okay, I'm not going to pretend it's not. But does he deserve this? No, he doesn't. And we live in a world where a Jesuit priest who molested nine nuns gets a pass. Um, uh, Cardinal or, or Archbishop Zucchetta gets a pass. You know what I mean? Like, there's so many examples. Father James Martin, every day embracing the homosexual lifestyle, gets a pass. Now, you might argue, but Joe, Father James Martin does not uh, argue in disobedience to his bishop. You're right, because his bishop accepts it and lets it go. Uh, Bishop Neistout's in trouble right now for allegedly covering up uh, a sexual predator priest. And uh, George Neumeier was... uh, confronting him over the weekend, and he got banned. He got a lifetime banned from the, from the cathedral. You should check out uh, George Neumeier's Twitter feed for details on that story. You know, like, so there's so many examples that the, pre- the Italian priest who said mass in the water without a shirt on, in his bathing suit, on a float, Disgusting. on a float with teenagers in Sacrilid, scantily blasphemy. clad bathing suits, he got a pass. He didn't get... Uh, censured. He got, I think he got a, a stern talking to by his bishop, and that was the extent of it. Like, that's it. He gets a pass. But Father Frank Pavone gets tossed from the priesthood. That's, that's not good. That's a double standard. That's a hypocrisy. And if you're going to apply the, the if you're going to apply this, apply it evenly. Yeah, I agree. And the other thing is, these, uh, 
the accusation of blasphemy. I think I think you read this. Uh, you, you I may have mentioned it off air that the accusation of blasphemy does not have a canonical penalty. No, I read it on air. Oh, you did read it. I read it from the okay. article from Father Gerald th- Murray. Yeah, that's what I thought. Do you I want to remember read it again? Or? No, I mean, I was just yeah. making the point that this is not a canonical crime. It's a sin. It's now, a mortal sin. Yeah. And if in a just society, the blasphemy would be punished to the highest degree. Like, this is a very, very mm. great crime. King Louis the Ninth, yeah. <laughs> he would give you a correction once. He'd scourge you and if yeah. you blaspheme. And if he did it a second time, yeah, then oh, yeah. he'd execute you. So, yeah. I mean, it's, this is a grave, grave evil blasphemy. And we need to take it very seriously. But are we applying that across the board? Are we going to start? Is the, is, the, is the bishops of Rome? And please, I would love this. I would love this. Are the bishops of Rome going to come out and publicly condemn blasphemy and order all Catholics saying, yeah. hey, we're gonna, this is going to be an excommunicatable offense from now on. If you commit the sin of blasphemy, you are going to be excommunicated and make that a rule. And say we're using but Father Pavone as a test case just to show thing, our point. Though, that'd be that'd be interesting. If we're talking about the devils and the details, who who came up with that statement, by the way? <laughs> the devils and the details. So, all right. So, uh, Father Frank Pavone, uh, which I played the clip of him actually addressing this in the first segment that I dealt with this today. So you can always rewind, check it out, first hour. Um, from his, he actually says this was part of what they got him on was using the GD. In a Twitter response, talking about Biden, GD Biden is basically what he said. You know, he used expletives. He used the GD again. I I, I couldn't stand that when he did that. <laughs> when I saw that, I'm like, oh, dude, that's wrong. Like, you shouldn't be talking this way. Uh, we we need we need to take the higher road uh, because our enemies will use this against us. Clearly, they have used it against him, and he knows that. He said he went to confession. He confessed this, and he made penance. Praise God. That's all anybody could ask at this point. But um, is the use of that GD, and like, did, did he really intend to condemn Biden to hell forever? I mean, like, you know what I mean? Like, does that, does that use case arise to the level of blasphemy? Isn't blasphemy part of the, isn't part of blasphemy not just the words you say, but the intent behind it? Well. I mean, I guess there's a casual mm, blasphemy. Yeah. It was a casual, like, in other words, don't even play around with these words. Like, don't even, yeah. don't think them, don't say them. Like, I get that. Like, for, yeah, fair enough. But there, there's one thing to say, Father, you shouldn't talk that way. Versus, Father, for your crime, we are casting you out of the priesthood. Like, that's a whole other level that seems disproportionate to the crime. Yeah, and I mean, I've certainly heard priest blasphemy before, especially the casual way, not like, like you're saying, there's a difference between intentional and then casual and 99% of the time it's casual. Uh, either way, it's both bad. One is just worse. There's mm. degrees of bad. Mm-hmm. And so casual blasphemy is obviously a lesser sin, but it's still a mortal sin to, to blaspheme. And the, but if you're going to be intentionally doing, it, then it becomes a grave, grave evil. So yeah. Yeah, so now I guess the other thing that could be said here is we're 8 o'clock and running out of time. The, if the Pope wanted to, he could reinstate him. Yeah. He has the authority to do so. I mean, he did for that bishop. He's, I mean, yeah, the bishop, oh, there, the there, Jesuit. There, there, are, there are priests all the time that get reinstated after having left the priesthood personally or, or whatever. I mean, there's lots of stories of the Pope. I had a pastor who did that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. it could happen. So who knows? He could be Father Frank Pavone again possible yeah let's pray for him let's pray for the church uh we cannot get to the second coming without first the man of perdition the antichrist coming on the stage first and we can't get to see him until the great apostasy happens before that and how do you get to the great apostasy unless hypocrisy and double standards are the order of the day pray fast and do penance christ is coming soon soon and very soon we'll see you guys tomorrow Joining us on your Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is a friend of mine. If God don't do it, it won't get done. If God don't do it, it won't get done. If God don't do it, what up with that? What up with that? What are we talking about? Go, Brandon, I agree.